I could not believe what I was seeing. I could have filled the back of his head with 556, which is an absolute joke. Well, it's not an ape, because if the Sasquatch was an ape, we would already have one. What are these elusive hominids that stalk the wilderness? Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevning. Welcome to the mystery. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Creek Devil. Tom, you're involved in this situation, so I'm going to have you jump this thing off. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is my friends, uh, Kurt and his wife, Laura. And last week, we went out to an area that Kurt's very familiar with. And he's, uh, w initially, we just went out there to uh, do a little videotaping. And, and you know, it was a you know, we weren't looking for anything, but that's really not what happened. We ended up getting a lot of activity, a lot of vocalizations, and we're going to talk about that. But um, so I'm going to start off with Kurt. You took me to, and and this is the funny part. We went up there and we we had forgotten something, so we drove back to town. We got that. We came back. And actually, that was fortuitous. That was perfect because that got us back to your area at more towards a late afternoon, early evening. Yeah. And yeah, so we hiked up to where you had an encounter two years ago. And we were finding some evidence on the trees and we found snap trees, but we also heard that sharp whistle there was other things we heard but i think for the benefit of our audience maybe give us a brief recap of what happened in that area two years ago two years ago it was uh on a saturday i was deer hunting it was late evening like where we were this last weekend and i come into an area just inside the timber and there's a bunch of mushrooms there and i bent down and i set my rifle down and i set my backpack down and i started cutting the, sh the chanterelle mushrooms there and uh i'd say about a minute goes by and i i, I hear a whoop i stopped and i listened i didn't see nothing did didn't hear anything more i went back down and started cutting some more mushrooms it got a little more, a little louder this time, and whoop! I looked again, and I couldn't see nothing. I went back down and started cutting again, and the third time is when I went, and it threw. It had to have been a log because you know there was no rocks in that area that you and I walked through. Where did that land? Did it crash next to you, or? It was, it was, it came from behind me. Okay. So you didn't see it, but you heard it hit the ground, right? Yeah. And you and I are Oregonians. Yep. Which, which uh, breed of elk or bear or mountain lion does that? Uh, <laughs> neither, neither. None. <laughs> Now let's let's take you back two weeks before that even. Their opening day of deer season, the wife and I and another friend were sitting in that clear cut just before daylight. And remember I told you about the trees that we heard snapping. Right. We heard that that morning in that same area, we heard probably four or five trees that were that sounded like they were sna being snapped off. And there was a clear, they just freshly clear cut it on the other side. And so I thought maybe, well, maybe it's trees from that clear cut that just were still standing, they haven't fell yet. 
And then the sec the the next week is when I had the encounter. And at that point in time, I didn't go back up into that area until March of of last year. After your encounter, yeah. After the encounter. That was how long? Sorry. It was eight months. Eight okay. Months was that because of, did you get a little bit jittery or because of the tree break, you know, the snapping or, or just that's the way it was? No, the, with the scream and yell at me and uh, it, it made me nervous. And I, I'm, I'm a daylight to dark hunter that day. It was still daylight out. And I told the wife, I said, we're leaving. And we're we're not coming back. I'm not coming back to this area for a while. Laura, would you comment because you talked about that when we were videotaping, um, yeah. and you had mentioned something about you know Kurt doesn't normally talk that much anyway. No. <laughs> but this was no. unusual. It was really unusual. Um, like we got back, and I had driven down, and he said when I saw him, you know, I turned around, and saw him, and he said we're leaving, and I said oh we're going back up to the higher mountain you know, the other spot where we started. And he said, no, we're going home. And I was asked him again. And uh, he said, no, we're going home. And he, we had a, I'm gonna say a 30 minute drive home and maybe more. And he didn't say a word. Again, he doesn't talk a lot, but he didn't say a word. I really don't recall how long it took him to even tell me about this. I know it wasn't that day. I want to say it was a week, but he could probably remember more than I, but I know he didn't even mention it to me for a while. And then when I did start hearing, uh, that's all I'll say on that, I guess. <laughs> just He started checking everything out on YouTube. That was all I was going to say. Just looking at okay. everything. You know, I think even maybe before he told me, that's what I remember. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was, you know, on the TV, there was all this Bigfoot stuff, more than usual. Because we are enthusiasts. We, you know, we've been checking it out for a while. But Yeah, it, it's different when you have the encounter. Um, and I'm I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit, and then we'll come back. But that's interesting, Kurt, about the tree crashing because the weird thing that Laura recorded Sunday, you and I were about a hundred yards up that mountain. And by the way, I just want to say that there's there's no game trail, there's no trail whatsoever. We were just solid bushwhacking through very heavy understory, which is all the I don't know, vine maples or whatever it was, you know, Oregon grape, that sort of thing. And I heard three very loud, distinct cracks, very loud, almost, you know, not quite like a like a 38 going off, but it was pretty loud. And uh, we decided to go back. So, but, so tell us a little bit about, all right, so you, you're cutting the chanterelles, something makes that, weird vocalization throw something at you and you're like okay i'm out of here at that moment what was going through your head um i didn't know what it was but when i heard the vocalization uh, at that point i knew it was a sasquatch or a bigfoot because there's nobody else that makes that kind of a noise and there's there's nobody, you know that there's nobody in that area where I'm at right. that would be out there doing something that's stupid. There's nobody there. I'm going to go ahead and just mention that a little bit. This is actually on private property, and access is extremely limited. Uh, you can't get to it unless you have permission. So, um, yeah. Forrest, I wanted to get your comment real quick on the vocalization and the fact that Kurt is, you know, he's harvesting chanterelles. Maybe the creatures like that and they felt that he was taking something that belonged to them. What are your thoughts? Well, primates, gorillas, and chimpanzees will call out if somebody is in their territory. Uh, they don't particularly like it, um, and uh, I would assume that that's exactly correct. Uh, and it's a, it, this is strictly an assumption on my part, but it would make sense that that's exactly what is happening. You're in their territory; they don't want you there. You're 
harvesting a food source for them. Uh, as far as they're concerned, you don't need it. They do. And they want you out of there. Uh, yeah. mm-hmm. And it's a lot easier. Were you carrying a, a weapon at the time? Yes, I was. Okay. <clears throat> and that, see, that, that would indicate to me that I, I and all the, the stories that I hear about Bigfoot, I think they do realize that, uh, um, that guns are a weapon of death and mm. injury. So um, the fact that they may have seen, they were ob- obviously paying attention to what you were doing and observing you, um, that they didn't want a direct confrontation. So it was a lot easier to scream, throw rocks at you and break uh, uh, branches. And that, that's a typical primate behavior as well. You know, breaking branches and chimpanzees, when they get extremely agitated, will go running through the woods, breaking branches, uh, dragging tree limbs and, and throwing them about. So that is, that is very, very typical primate behavior. They just wanted you out of there and they didn't want a direct confrontation with you. Do you feel better now, Kurt? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel better. My hair's standing out, and I haven't really you, you been know, nervous about you this. You know I don't like being up in that mountain at night. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you and I, we walked up there, and so we went to, you showed me the exact spot where you were harvesting the chanterelles and, you know, the direction the, uh, the whatever it was got thrown at you and the vocalizations. And we went down and we looked at some very strange markings on trees, uh, obviously made by something with either very large toes or a large hand, very high up the tree. Yes. And as we're looking at, I'm trying to remember, is right around that time period, we heard a sharp whistle. Yes. And again, it's with a thousand percent certainty there were there was nobody else in the forest. No. So we worked our way back, and as we worked our way back through this non, you know, there there's no trails, just kind of bushwhacking through the through the through the forest. And then you pointed out a tree that had been snapped, broken off, and then it, the entire top part of it was quite a ways it wasn't wind damage something had snapped it and thrown it over there yes and i again i think i'm just going to ask Forrest real quick um as far as the breaking of trees because this is something that's you know real common with bigfoot what what about uh primate behavior is this something that you've heard of or familiar with well, yeah, chimpanzees do it. Now, now did, let me clarify something. Did they break the tree limb and, and place it across the path that you had come in on? No, they, they, broke, they broke the whole top of the tree out, and it was laying up against the far side of the bank. And this is probably about a 10, 12-foot wide, wide uh, dirt road. There's a dirt road there? Yeah. And this was after y'all had been in there. What was that? It was after y'all had, this is on your way out, correct? Yeah, this is on the way out that that uh, that uh, Tom and I noticed. Now, see, I would be concerned about that. That always concerns me when I hear about tree breaks and trees being pushed down and uh, people having to actually get out and cut their way back out of the the. Uh, when they go up roads and into these uh, areas where they're uh, prevalent, I, that there bothers me because that almost seems like they're preventing, they're trying to prevent you from getting out. And yeah. uh, that, 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 that I find disturbing. Yes. Yes. But yes, primates do break trees. They push them down. And uh, you know, like I said, uh, chimpanzees will grab limbs and just go, running wildly through the forest, thrashing and, and beating them on uh, other trees and when they get into a real agitated uh, state. So I, that would disturb me, that they would be pushing down trees, almost like blocking your exit. And Kurt, we weren't uh, in the slightest bit concerned, were we? Oh, no, no. <laughs> You're picking up the dry sarcasm? Sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Tom? Uh, yeah. 
I remember I gave you that big chunk of log that I found after I, I, I went back in March. I found that tree that they broke and it had all the it had all of the markings on it. I cut it up and I I cut it up and I brought it out of the mountain back home. Yeah, and, and I've got it in my garage at this right now. Yeah. Um, and basically what it looks like, I did a little bit of poking into it and just by pure happenstance, I found a uh, an arborist who is talking about um, something called basal scarring. And basal scarring is where you have a big chunk of bark that's been removed. But this is also basal scarring where something has either its toe or a large finger has scraped the side of the tree. And it's, you know, the width of that was inch and a half maybe a bit more and broken branches right below it. So there was something that had scampered up this tree and, and, you know, and done this damage for reasons known only to it. Okay. So we, I would say we were up there. What you think maybe 45 minutes before we finally worked our way back down to the vehicle Yeah. down to the truck. Okay. And then you, uh, you and Laura took me up to another area where you had heard uh, like whoops. And tell us what happened there, because we did get some vocalizations there as well. Describe the area. Hang on, and... so... Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and talk. He, he just can't speak to you right now. There's somebody at our door, but go ahead. Oh, okay, gotcha. All <laughs> right. And Laura, you remember, because we went up there where we're looking around surveying the area and you had mentioned that kurt had kurt and you were up there at one time and you had heard a whoop and on that day we also heard some whoops and these are coming from you know this is a basically a, a cleared yeah, out kurt, land need to get back to this sorry oh no worries at all so I, again this was a a log area it was cleared out and I would say cleared out to three, four hundred yards from where we were to the tree line. And on that day, or by this time it's evening, we heard a couple of whoops. And you heard them as well, right? Yeah. Okay. And so that's the first time I've ever actually heard a whoop. And I'm trying to think, there's nothing else that makes... You know, that's that's a primate sound. <laughs> that sounds like it. Well, Kurt, and now that's the area is, or I should ask you, is that the same area that you described to me that you and Laura had heard whoops uh, a year earlier? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Um. I'm drawing a blank right now. Well, it, it, as I recall, you had, um, you and Laura were telling me that you had heard whoops from there. And I was asking you, well, was it right at the tree line or deeper into the forest? Oh, that was in a year ago. That, that, was, that was, was that was just three weeks ago. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Okay. All right. That's, that's where you're drawing a blank because I'm giving yeah. you bad information. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. That's all right. right. So describe that. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. What what happened? Well, uh, I went I just came from the bot from the bottom of that clear cut where I took you. I got up on top and we're looking over the clear cut all of the whole thing. And I, I'd say it had been five or 10 minutes. And I'm sitting there and, and we're looking. And off in the distance, I hear a whoo. And I didn't think nothing of it. And about a couple more minutes goes by and it does it again. Laura heard it that time. Mm -hmm. And I, I go, did you hear that? She said, yeah. And then not more than about another two minutes later and the thing was louder on the third time. And it was, it was coming towards us. It was in the tree line. It yeah. was. It was in, by that time. I was at the pretty close to the edge of the tree line. 
but it was deeper in the timber when it started out. And is it, I'm just one of a process of elimination. This could not have been a bird or an elk. No, no. And here in Okay. Um, Forrest, what are your thoughts on that as far as those type of vocalizations? Well, whoops are, are, are very typical primate vocalizations. Um, they hoot, they holler, they, um, and they have good sets of lungs on them. Uh, and obviously Bigfoot's going to be equipped with an even larger set of uh, lungs. Um, I, I guess what would distress me is the fact that it started at a distance and then got closer and closer and closer. Uh, obviously, it's uh, <laughs> coming to your location. Uh, and that would be, to me, an indication it's time to leave, you know. Right. Yeah, it's it's taken an interest in us. Now, what we heard Sunday wasn't the woo-woo like that. It was a just a one sharp whoop. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and that was interesting. It was I'd never heard that before. And it was a little bit you know something's out there. Uh I took comfort in the fact that whatever was out there was at least four hundred yards away in order for it to get to us. Well, if it was going to cross the clearing, you have to go across a clear cut area. Um so you know, it, it's got a ways to go to get to us. You know, I Get, try to get comfort in something in these situations. <laughs> um, so we stayed there for a bit longer, and and we were surveying the area that we had just been in, right? You were pointing out, okay, uh, 20 minutes ago, we were down at that uh, tree line down there. You're pointing that out. And we had a lot of birds that were just now start there they were silent by the way when we were at the first location now they're kind of picking up and this is going to be important for the next part of the story so i i think that's where we went and you we went to another landing and what was the purpose of that landing what was the significance of that one that landing there is where i showed you where i walked down from when I had when I had my encounter, I got clear clear up on the top of that landing, and I walked all the way down through that clear cut down into the timber where I come had my had my encounter. Okay, and this area is it's kind of interesting because you're at the top of a landing. I'm just going to kind of paint a word picture here. Again, you got a clear cut down there. And we are parked next to a pretty substantial pile, a burn pile that is actually, you know, they, they had burned it, but there's still huge stumps. And if you were behind that, it would be a good eight or nine feet drop that you would you could conceal yourself. On the other side of the of the truck is, uh, for lack of a better word, it's just a, a huge reprod area tree farm okay and it's fenced off and there's an opening in the fence and you said hey and you let's go up here because you're going to show me something and we hiked up about a hundred yards yeah and that's the area that had absolutely no you know i was hoping for a trail but no such luck it was all thick heavy understory that was anywhere from two and a half to three feet high. And so you're just thrashing, you're bushwhacking through this and you're making a lot of ruckus. And that's where we were about a hundred yards up and off to my right, I heard three very distinct loud cracks. And I couldn't tell if something was actually breaking a tree or maybe even pushing a tree over, but it was pretty significant. Now, before we went up there, we were hearing, I don't think they're crows, I think they're probably ravens making a lot of noise. And Laura, you stayed in the truck while Kurt and I hiked up there. Yes. Tell us what you heard with the ravens and what yeah. what was going on there. 
So as you described, I was closed in. I couldn't really see anything. I was just on the landing. There was no clear cut. Um, and I was observing, I was calling them crows, but pod rays, crow, crows or ravens. Um, I was just, I felt like there was overabundance of this sound. And to me, it seemed to be coming like in front of you. And I just, it sounded just really weird. So I started recording. Um, I, I did a video, it happened to be the palm of my hand, but um, I just quickly turned on my video and I was just like, I'm gonna see what's going on out there. This is really weird. And I sat there in the truck and, and um, just kept the recording going. And, um, you know, I felt pretty comfortable, been up in this area lots and lots of times. But usually I'm walking at least a little bit of that walk. And um, I just um, thought it was odd. Um, you know, I was hearing you guys come back and I was hearing some, some thrashing and stuff. But um, then actually we get in the truck and we leave and I start listening to my ear. I start listening to this recording and I'm like, wow, that sounds like some wild pigs or something out there. We don't have pigs. I, I didn't know what it was. And, um, you know, I actually tried several times to try to connect it to our Bluetooth in a truck because I was super adamant about you guys need to listen to this. And I couldn't get it to work. And I'm just going to go on and share this that um, when we got home, I said, Kurt, you know, listen to this. And he's holding it up to his ear so he can hear it. And he literally practically he did drop the phone when he heard this vocalization and again, not having much experience, any experience and just, you know, um, hearing what I hear around um, and shows and things like that. Um, you know, I'm still like, eh, what is it? You know, I don't know. It certainly wasn't any animals we know. Uh, wasn't even a bear. I've heard bears. Uh, usually he's you know, like you know, other things. But um, yeah, it was just uh, the, and then and then after he got scared, then I listened to it a couple of times. And the more I listened to it, I got kind of the skin crawly like, wow, OK, um, <clears throat> I'm in the truck alone. I had a sidearm on me, but what if indeed something was close to me? You know, um, I went into that night actually not being terrified, but I, I had trouble sleeping thinking, God, what would I have done all alone in the truck? You know, usually I have my my guy here to um, <laughs> with me to protect me from stuff. But um, it was. Uh, I, it was exciting yet scary yeah it was it was i hadn't heard anything quite like it and i actually sent that audio to forest and it's interesting that you said kurt actually dropped the phone because you guys were texting me like mad and it's <laughs> it's it's just one of those things in in nature that when you were texting me i was getting phone calls and texts all at the same time, been quiet the whole day and all of a sudden, bam, 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 everybody's <laughs> getting a hold of me at once. So I'm, I'm trying to multitask. Um, but Forrest, you heard that and tell us what your, you know, what was your, you and the cats, <laughs> what was your response <laughs> when you first listened to it? Well, the first time I listened to it, I actually had it up to my ear. <laughs> I have to laugh, Kurt, because my response was exactly the same as yours. And I told Tom, Tom knows this because I told him, um, sweetie, Laura, if I'd have been you, I would have been hoping that I had a pair of Depends close at hand because <laughs> I, I, I literally dropped the phone. I then turned it on a speaker and I had every cat in my bedroom absolutely <laughs> watching they were all looking at me like what you know it was a what the heck is that <laughs> mom and uh you know when i i told you tom when i was first listening to that mike uh, okay uh, laura i'm gonna ask you something real quick here yes uh did you possibly hit the phone on the uh the door or the uh the window when you when you put it out because oh. i hear a thump um, well, okay. I did kind of, I think I moved my hand. It was in my hand. And so I think I did move. And I looked at that and we checked it and checked it. And you can see that in that moment, I'm not moving it. And actually I have, a, I took a couple other videos too. And you can see, though you can even hear in those where I've, I've touched it with my hand and it makes a different sound. Okay. Um, well, I actually asked Tom about the thump because uh, I found that interesting because 
you hear that little thump and then uh and it's a faint thump it's not real heavy but oh, then yeah. what i was listening to was right before the raven started calling and you know what i'm talking about tom i heard i would have sworn that i heard primate barking calls way off in the distance there that's what i was listening to and that's what i thought you were recording until the ravens and then the next and oh my god i i did i dropped the phone i had chills all up and down my body uh girl i'm telling you what and then that's when i started asking tom i said how close were the woods uh what uh did and i, I even asked him to identify uh, to describe the vehicle and he told me it was a crew cab and then i asked you if it was a dually because that's what i have is a crew cab dually and those those wheels uh can uh actually they can hide a lot of stuff behind the vehicle and uh, i was wanting to know how close uh that something could have come up to that vehicle because you actually hear the 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 growl and then the inhalation of air at the end and i'm telling you what that i have listened to it over and over and it has never failed to not give me chills and it 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 scares me um, the more and, and I hear it, the more I and listen to it. what you had it. with you was nothing but a pea shooter. You couldn't have defended yourself from no. something no. that made that sound. Hey, Forrest. Mm-hmm. Forrest, I... Oh, go ahead. I was just going to make a quick comment. You know, I, I told Tom, mm-hmm. I, I listened to it on my phone when he sent it to me, and initially it does make a, a pig-like sound, but that's that's not correct. When you put the headphones on and listen to it, it's not pig-like at all. And you're right, Forrest. You can hear no, the exhalation no, and everything no, going no, on there. It's not. I think I thought pigs because I used to be around pigs. So, <laughs> but uh, no. Yeah, when you listen to it better, it's it's too. definitely different. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, uh-uh. uh. Yeah, and I actually listened to it on uh, um, a, a large audio speaker, and uh, I, I like I said, I've listened to it over and over and over, and I went and I ran uh, every known sound. Tom knows this because he and I were on the phone back and forth uh, to to try to correlate it with it. And I said, that's that, that sounds like a primate con- combined with a lion uh, sound. And I said, uh, there, there's nothing else I can identify it with. And something to remember about that area, folks, is number one, there aren't any wild hogs up there. And secondly, nope. there's a large group of these creatures yeah. in that particular place. And we know that. You know, Forrest, and do you remember I sent it to you and I asked you for your professional opinion? <laughs> and what was your response to that? Well, you, uh, can I say that on air? <laughs> oh, go ahead. <laughs> I, oh, yeah, you know me. Uh, bar the, <laughs> it's never bar the door, Katie. Um, I said, holy shit. You, you said, what's my professional opinion? And I said, holy shit is my professional <laughs> opinion. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> oh <laughs> I'm uh, and that you. spoke volumes <laughs> <laughs> you know it's funny well, though I, because you said you heard that primate like barking and we have a new voice actor his name's jeff and he's also uh, a professional audio you know he's he's done that professionally in the past and i mean he is he's obsessed with with you know, tearing it apart and using uh, various software. He said, hey, he goes, that does not sound like crows. He says it really sounds like something barking and something answering in a bark. Yeah. It's funny yeah. that you and said that as well. Well, and that's what I was listening to it. I had it plastered. I am telling you, I had it plastered to my ear because it's not real loud. It's, it's faint. And then you hear the crows and I actually... I, that's why I just I dropped the phone when I heard that that growl. I was just it scared the bejesus out of me. I'm telling you, and I wasn't even there, so uh, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> and you said the cats yeah. were were they're like mom. I hope that's yeah. on the phone and not here. <laughs> yes, I, they were all staring at me, and I'm like, I didn't do that. Don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, no, they were distressed. Yeah. And I mean, and they they recognized it as something not being very nice. And I'm telling you right now. <laughs> it 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 reminded me of that very much of that growl that came from my window that night that I told you that 
uh, <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. I, I, well, I tell us about that. Oh, well, that okay. was the night that at the, the window that uh, Lagatha, uh, something growled at her, and she just literally melted into the, the bottom of the kennel. That's when I had her, used to have her kennel right up next to my bedroom window. And, uh, yeah. What so, kind of a dog is Lagatha? Uh, she is a Belgian Malinois. Mm-hmm. And she's a, a she's a, a quite a, a large dog. She's an eighty two pound Belgian Malinois. Okay, and just I think most most of our listeners probably know, but for those who don't, it's it's kind of like a German Shepherd, but they're the same ones that the military uses, and they don't have the problems, uh, hip displacement and stuff that German Shepherds sometimes develop. Yeah, I, my husband was in the Air Force, and uh, all the SPs uh, pretty much have gone to all uh, Belgian Malinois because they don't have the, the physical problems that uh, your German Shepherds have uh, developed. So Yeah, and they're um, smart dogs. Oh, extremely intelligent, extremely. She, she, I think she's smarter than me sometimes. <laughs> so getting back to this, I find it interesting that you – it reminded you of your experience where one made a vocalization outside of your house and you heard it and this sounded similar or. Well, this was the one that was, that you recorded sounded like a much larger, bigger animal. Uh, I'm, I'm telling you that, um, <clears throat> had I heard that it, you did not hear that Laura, uh, was it not audible to you? No, I'm I'm a little hard of hearing. I'm actually pretty darn oh, hard of hearing. So that's the only thing I could think of. Um, but I just wanted to speak to you know when you talked about um, when you heard the the birds or whatever that were in the distance. That's actually what I thought. Literally, I'm like, oh my god, that's too much. That seems like primate-ish, and I don't even know primate stuff, you know. And that is why I started hearing it. So it, it maybe it even changed by the time. You know, I got into the recording very much, but I thought, I just want to speak to that. I thought that was really intriguing that you had said that. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not shaking over here a little more. I thought, so was it behind my vehicle? You know, I've heard people talk mm. about that, you know, hey. and I'm usually fairly in, observant in my surroundings. But, you know, we have a big canopy on the truck, you know, and um, I wouldn't have been able to see anything behind me. I wasn't. I was pretty, you know, chill, nonchalant. But um, the more I think about this, and and uh, I don't even know if I want to hear the recording anymore. <laughs> hey, Forrest, a little bit of yeah, speculation uh, from an anthropological point of view. What do you think that vocalization might have been, or what? It, what the purpose? You know what? From my anthropological professional, um, holy shit! Um, it, it it was scary, Will. And I don't think that it was a good thing, seriously. Uh, they don't usually uh, emit a growl like that unless it's serious business. I, and, I, I and would I, guess, yeah, I would guess they were maneuvering on the vehicle. That's what I, that was exactly my thought. And I even asked Tom, Tom, you remember this. I said, did she have any weapons with her? And he said she had a nine millimeter. And I was like, that's a pea shooter. Hmm. Um, you know, uh, did they leave you the keys? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Good question. <laughs> we leave the keys with us now. And, you know, I thought about it that night. The only thing I would have done is, is honk the horn, whether it would have scared something away or not. I don't know. I know I wouldn't have drawn because I wouldn't have. I know it wouldn't have done well, it. Well, no, you wouldn't have gone off and left them, but I was kind of being uh, smart right. LAP there right. by saying that. Yeah. But right. I think I would, I would have See, so hit the <laughs> horn and just laid on it and, uh, yeah. you know, Oftentimes, loud sounds like that can take them uh, aback, and uh, you know, oh, and and then they will scatter. But you know, who's to say what's in the mind of a Bigfoot? I mean, uh, I don't think I don't know of any Bigfoot psychologists. So it depends uh, on their level anyway. of experience, too. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it really does. You know, what bothers them and what doesn't. It depends on their oh. level of experience and how how they approach a situation like that. Yeah, exactly. If they had never heard one before, then it it might uh, it might work definitely. Laura, I'm going to ask you real quick. 
when, when we as soon as we got back to the truck, you were adamant that <laughs> the Ravens didn't sound right. There was something about them that just didn't sound right. And and that was the reason you decided to start recording. Is that right? That's absolutely correct. Yeah. Yeah. And I think even as you know, the sound, I, I can't, even as I said, it it was really loud, a little odder than, you know, we usually hear those things in my in my brain. I was thinking, God, I think there's something out there and they're leading them away. I don't know where they were to you guys. I think you mentioned once, but I don't know really where they were. We hadn't discussed that. But my brain was like, that's something. I'm going to listen to this. I'm going to get this on recording. And and um, I think something's trying to lead them away. That was my interpretation. Did I worry about what was there with me? Not in the slightest. <laughs> nah, I do now. But, <laughs> um, hey, you know, and I actually another couple of recordings yeah. that I think have more noise. Go ahead. Well, you just said something that's stuck in my mind about leading them away and tom we had that situation happen in september where we they were oh, yeah. attempting to lead us to a different location that's exactly right yeah and um you know it's funny because listening to the recording this is something that jeff pointed out there were the sounds were so identical when it went it's not really a caw, but for the lack of a better word, a caw or a bark or whatever. Well, caw, caw, caw. They were identical, the 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 cadence, the tempo. It's like it was if you took a cookie cutter and had cookie cutter sounds identical, that's what it was. And then the reply back, which was further away, was virtually identical. It's like something went caw, 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 and it caw, 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 a little quieter. And we've seen that elsewhere. Oh. Um, I, I looked okay. for, it wasn't a crow noise. These were actually coyote-like noises, and this happened in the early 70s south of Puyallup, Washington, when the Puyallup Screamer events were going on. And I don't have, I don't think I have the recording anymore, but John Green gave me a tape years ago that they had made a copy of it, and on the first part of the tape, the tape was recorded inside of a house with all the doors and windows closed. And the maker of the screams, they estimated about a quarter of a mile plus away from the house. It sounds like it's right outside the window. And then they did a recording of known coyotes. And you listen to the two recordings, and they were completely different. But that first recording, it was like you said, Tom, they were consistent from beginning to the end of each vocal. There was a consistent level of audio. And with the coyotes, it was yipping and barking, and, and the audio levels weren't the same in each vocal. That's exactly right. You mentioned that, and I think that's what made me... I actually went out and downloaded uh, Raven Sounds and Crow Sounds and compared. They're different. And it, and it reminds me, uh, Will, the area that you and I were at in September uh, in that meadow, uh, I was up there... <clears throat> Oh, about a year earlier with a couple of guys, you know who they are. And 10 o'clock at night, we're hearing kind of like coyotes, but not quite. Yeah. And one guy says to the other one, hey, those are not effing coyotes. <laughs> <laughs> and they weren't. You can tell the difference. If you know animal sounds, you can tell the difference. To the untrained ear, right. you wouldn't know. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Kurt, I want to say something real quick. Next time the three of us go out, I want you to be real nice to Laura because I don't want to come back down off the mountain and not have the truck there waiting for us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been interesting. <laughs> that would be a very long walk. <laughs> but, you know, and Kurt, it's. It, we went back, I'm trying to re remember the, you know, progression of events with you and I, but we went back to the truck and then we, <clears throat> you took me up to another area where we found some, found some very odd um, stuff with the trees. And at that time, you, um, you mentioned to me, and the whole time this is going on, hello, I'm hearing these noises and I'm just, in my mind, it's crows, not even paying attention to them. 
But you said that they were actually around us or they were starting to come around us in that other location. Yeah. Okay. So that that's still, really, that's still, yeah. That was, still, that was still on top of that landing there. Yep. Where we were having all that vocalization. I took you out to out in front of the pickup into the timber there and showed you those tree structures that I found. Right, right. That's where that's where they were really loud right there. So and that that's consistent with when we first got out of the truck. Yeah. Um it was in the same direction where they were really loud. And they were a lot louder there. So glad we didn't go any further because <clears throat> and I gotta say when we were looking at that stuff, um, and I'm the last guy in the world to get weird vibes. It just doesn't happen with me. I don't know why. I guess I'm just too dumb. I don't know. But I just started to feel like, hey, uh, let's leave. I really felt like, okay, great. We've seen it. Let's go. And uh, I just, I don't know. Did you have a feeling like that? Like, it's really time to leave? Yeah. Yeah, I was real happy to turn I, around I, and head back. I had the same feeling until we got to the opening of the of the fence, and I wanted to show you up on the up in that tree tree uh, tree farm. Yeah, and we never made it to the top because no. yeah, I heard the loud cracking. And so, just for our listeners, where all the crows or whatever the heck they were that was making all that noise, that would have been to our left and the the loud cracking of the tree breaking or being pushed over or whatever was to our right so that would be effectively they've kind of encircled us or we walked into us you know into a group of these things mm. Mm. so i'm glad you didn't drive off laura um. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think I'm glad to. <laughs> I do care about the spelling. Yeah. Oh, good, 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 good. <laughs> um, Forrest, what are your thoughts based on what I just said with the us kind of being encircled by these things? Is this anything that uh, primates do? Uh, yes. <clears throat> Chimpanzees are well known for doing that. Uh, it's not a good thing. Um, I think I told you the story about the, the, the Billy Apes with the lady that was doing research on them. You know, this is another uh, ape that has, been dis <laughs> that has been discovered. However, the natives had been talking about them and had been aware of their existence for hundreds of years. Does this sound like a familiar story? Um, and so this researcher goes out there. She's actually sitting down observing these animals. And the next thing she knows, she happens to look behind her. And there sits a um, Billy Ape male. And she suddenly realizes that she was surrounded by them. Um, now, I, I also told you that when they go out and do these research uh when they're researching these primates, um, they always have armed guards with them, um, not only for protection from the apes, but as well other uh, land predators that are out there. So <clears throat> I think she probably would have had protection, but still, I don't, I don't feel like uh, that they were coming there for a goodwill meeting. So, um, you know, they will do that. Um, chimpanzees do eat meat. They have been known to kill people and eat them and consume them in Africa. So it's not an unheard of thing. These billy apes, if nobody's familiar with them, look at, look them up. They are, uh, when they're standing at full height, they stand almost six feet tall. They're much larger than uh, pan troglodytes, which is your common chimpanzee. Um, they tend to be a gray color. Um, and they tend to like to walk bipedally quite frequently. Um, they weigh in usually anywhere from 300 to 350 in, in weight. So that is not something that you'd want to probably take on. Um, yes, it's a chimpanzee um, and it's a primate uh, ape, ape behavior. 
and I wouldn't want to uh, think that that would be a good thing. So y'all, you know, valor's the better part of discretion. Just get out of there. Yeah. Mm. You know, um, and talking about the Billy Apes, I think I've heard, <clears throat> number one, that even though the locals had seen them for centuries, those who are actually more intelligent and know more and more educated than the locals knew that this was just, well, you know, just local lore, of course, because they also talked about they slept on the ground. Oh, well, no, no, chimps don't do that because of the lions and the leopards. And they also, I had heard that they were resilient to poison darts. Um, what are your, any comments on that or? Well, I don't, I don't know anything about the poison darts. I can, uh, I can address the, uh, they are called the leopard killers. Um, they do sleep on the ground. Uh, pan troglodytes do not. They sleep in uh, the trees and uh, nest in the trees just like gorillas do. Um, these, uh, these particular apes are not um, in the least bit distressed by uh, big cats. And uh, big cats are most generally the, um, the predators of apes and monkeys. So um, they are not bothered by them in the least. And that's why they have the moniker of, you know, leopard killers. What are your thoughts about the uh, undereducated locals knowing about something that the uh, educated academics weren't aware of, so therefore it doesn't exist? But don't get me talking about academia and the higher educated people. Um, <clears throat> I, I, when I was doing archaeology, uh, we worked with a, a, a guy that had his doctorate, and he was an armchair archaeologist. And unfortunately, um, uh, a lot of your people with doctorates and, and higher education uh, tend to be just that armchair, uh, you know, professionals. And they have no working knowledge of actually being in the field. And I used to say about him uh, that he wouldn't have known an archaeological site if he felt he had first in the one, but uh, that's neither here nor there. There's a lot of them that are out there that are just like that. And, and, and unfortunately, just like in the Bigfoot field, as well you know, Will, uh, there's a lot of narcissists out there that think they know more than the next guy and um, I just, it absolutely uh, amazes me that you're supposedly trying to prove uh, the existence of uh, this primate and um, nobody wants to work together. It's all like everybody's working against each other. And uh, it's, it is that way at, in the academic academia as well. They're the same way. And I, I don't understand it. I don't even pretend to understand it. And um, so. Well, and they actually, <laughs> some of them will go out of their way to try to disprove it. So they're trying to prove a negative. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, interesting. So the Billy Ape does exist. Uh, when they were discovered, and when, when were they discovered? You know, uh, I want to say the 1980s is when they were finally uh, proven to exist. I may, I, I probably need to look that up because I, I don't remember exactly for sure. Um, but uh, uh, my mind is not a steel trap. But um, I'd have to look that up. But of course, you know, as well, we know the, the natives knew they existed for a long time. So, you know, sometimes it's maybe better that you listen to the people that live in that area as uh, uh you know that uh their that their imaginations haven't gone uh awry and that they're not all smoking uh strange things or eating strange mushrooms or something so magic mushrooms and they're having hallucinations so uh it 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 helps to listen to the the natives because they usually know they're more far more familiar with their surroundings than than the uh local white guys Absolutely. Yeah, it's a good starting point. Um, so 
when we were driving home, Kurt and Laura, I remember, Laura, you were asking about pigs in the area. And uh, I hate to say it. I was actually a little bit flippant. No, no, there's no pigs here. And I, I wasn't sure why you were mentioning that until I heard the audio. And I think, Will, are we able to maybe put a little portion of that audio on the end of this episode yeah i was going to mention that before we wrap this piece up um i'll be attaching that audio to the end of this it's not very long folks it's maybe what 30 seconds 30 seconds yeah yeah i'll be attaching that as soon as we're done here so stay tuned for that before the break yeah and if you got any cats in the room make sure the volume's turned up so <laughs> <laughs> Dogs, too, of course. Yeah. You yeah. know, we say that we say that flippantly. But you know what? <laughs> Animals have an innate <clears throat> sixth sense that sometimes I think people have lost. And <laughs> they they sense danger a lot quicker than we, we do. And they sure. recognize it. Self-preservation. Right. Yeah, exactly. We're the dumb ones that want to sit there and listen. Now, how did, did I really, <laughs> did I really hear what I heard? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the cats are like, we've heard enough. <laughs> yeah, we're gone. And, and then in the next, in the next instant, we get the blow upside the head. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we're still listening. <laughs> right. <laughs> and Tom, Tom knows where I'm going there with that one, so. Oh, I do. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. and, and if anybody is... And I know Will does too, so need I say more? <laughs> yeah, just it's one of the past episodes. I don't remember which one off the top of my head, but uh, Kurt and Laura, uh, I want to thank you guys not only for being on today's show, and we're going to have you on again, I'm sure, uh, many more times, mm -hmm. but I, I want to thank you guys. You really went out of your way to take me up to that area and Will, I got to say, I knew that when we went up there, we're just going to go up, we're going to videotape, and then we're going to go home. Um, and how many times have I said that? And it turned out to be <laughs> you're gonna have to, uh, a little more than I bargained you're for. You're going to have to throw out that thinking about go where they're not. Uh, and that's also, I should mention, it's not that far from where we were in September. No, no, it isn't. It's as far as these creatures are concerned. And um, so it's a uh, ah, very, very good area. Very interesting. So Can I Kurt and Laura. Question? Yes. Before we go, um, have there been any missing persons? And what about the loggers that work in that area? They might be someone that you might want to contact to uh, possibly maybe get some information about. They might know something or have seen stuff. And are there missing people in that area? <laughs> there, There is a missing person in that area from last year. Oh, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Okay. Well, we'll talk about that after uh, when we finish the recording. Um, again, um, Kurt and Laura, I want to thank you guys Again, you really extended yourselves to take me up there, and I appreciate that. And I really want to thank both of you for being available for today's show. Kurt, I know you didn't get a lot of sleep last night, and so uh, I hope you got some high-octane coffee. <laughs> it was nice. I, I'm, uh, I'm a little more um, edgy about going up there again. I was going to be cool with going up there, going camping in a little while, but... I'm not too sure now. <laughs> All righty. Well, let's wrap this segment up. We'll chat a little bit off the air. Uh, and everybody, like we mentioned, stay tuned before the break here. Uh, we're going to play the audio right now, so stand by.
in Bigfoot history. Nicowitz Creek drainage west of Bluff Creek, Northern California, early 1960s. J. Rowland, Willow Creek, tells of finding Bigfoot tracks near his campfire at night after two hounds had been killed by something they chased in the dark. He told me the hounds had been torn in two. We are back. Milo won't be joining us today. Milo's got a number of health issues he's had since um, he served in the go uh, in Iraq five times. So, you know, we, he has to deal with health issues on occasion. So, when he's back on his feet, he'll be back with us. But uh, Tom and Forrest, I guess we can start with some questions, unless there's some area you guys want to talk about. I'll just do a quick intro. Um, again, I just want to let everybody know. The questions that have come in, we really appreciate it. And uh, I just, um, some people write in and then they write back and want an answer in writing. And we actually do it on the air so so the whole audience gets the benefit. And if you like the show, uh, please uh, click like and subscribe. If you haven't done so already, you can also click subscribe. And uh, if you want to support the program, you can do so with uh, Patreon. we got a link in the description. All right. So, Tom, you want to start off with a question? I guess we can kickstart things that way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is a yeah. little bit about the um, Patterson-Gimlin film. Okay, Susanna wants to know. She says, I was wondering why Patty, from the PG footing f- footage, does... Uh, the short steps almost all encounters mention huge strides uh here it doesn't seem so and some say it's reason to think uh it's not legit or it's fake um so any comments from either one of you on that well you know what appears to be short steps in reality wasn't short steps you know what i mean because the size of the creature it may look shorter, but in reality, I think the step was quite a bit more than what it appears to be. That's actually a real good point. And, you know, they found a lot of footprints at the location. Did um, did either Patterson or uh, Gimlin measure the step or the stride? You know, I don't remember offhand. I think uh, Bob Titmus did. Okay. But that's actually a real good point. So, you know, you exactly, because you're looking at the size of the creature and it's not going to be extending its legs out. We would have to, if we were to try to mimic that, even a six and a half foot person would really be stretching their legs to get that. But you're talking a creature that's, I don't know, somewhere between seven and a half to eight foot tall, maybe a little bigger. And so just its natural gait would be those large large strides can i jump in here yeah um i think that uh uh, there is a monster quest out there where um and i I believe it was monster quest that actually had jeff meldrum um who that is his specialty is uh anatomical movement of humans and primates and he did an analysis of that film um and it, the way, I totally agree with Will, the, the size of the creature uh, is really, it leads you to, to believe that it's taking short st- uh, strides, but in fact it's taking longer strides. But I think that they did talk about, and I don't remember exactly what the, the measurement was, but somebody did do a measurement, and they actually had to find uh, somebody as close a human is close uh, anatomically in height to Patty, and um, the and they put those uh, laser points on them, and and of course the movement, you know, they have a compliant gait, and uh, we can't match that. It's at virtually impossible for a human because of our anatomical differences to be able to, in fact, match that gait perfectly. And they have a actually a smoother way of walking than we do and that's why you have uh, people that uh, have these 
sightings, but they always say that they appear to be gliding, and it, it's because of the compliant gait. And uh, they have they pick at the knee. They 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 pick their uh, lower portion of their leg up higher than we do. It almost comes in at a ninety degree angle and behind the knee, and we don't do that. And then their placement of their foot comes around and is almost. That's why they have almost a directional, uh, a perfect uh, direct stride. We have a scattered, uh, scattered. Hell, I can't even talk here. I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> staggered step when we walk, and um, Bigfoot do not. They walk in line. Yeah, that's a good point. And so, and I think in summary, you could just say that the creature is walking for what's a normal step for for itself, and that's that's the way it should be. But when we measure it, we're like, oh my gosh, look at how the thing was huge. Yeah, it was based on the footprints that come out around seven and a half feet. And I was just looking to see um, if anybody had actually done measurements, but I don't think anything was done at that time. Or if they were, Bob Titmus would have been the one to have done it. But I don't, I don't recall, um, you know, anything done. <clears throat> Everybody looked at everything else, but they didn't look at the, the step or stride measurements. You know, a thought just came to mind is suppose there is a race of people that were their average height was say four and a half foot tall, and then they take a look at one of our steps and stride. They're going to think those are enormous, but to us, it's uh, perfectly normal. Yeah, true. And like Forrest said, you know, the the structure of the creature, the way it walks is different, too. So what it appears to do on film is very different than what you find on the ground. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. Okay, so here we have somebody that Mike wants to know. He says, after hearing about Renee's belief concerning Osman and his changing story uh, he began to wonder how valid it could be one thing that stuck out was the snuff part why would the creature grab a whole can put it in its mouth without smelling or being cautious uh, maybe it was but I don't remember that from your story and and when it was affected by the snuff how did the creature know to grab his cup and drink it without question so an animal that probably never has drank from a cup, why now? And especially if the first thing coming from a human snuff was giving it issues, why would it take another thing from a human and make the same mistake twice? And I think that's that's an excellent observation. That's a good point. I, I seem to remember it running to whatever the water source was and getting water, but I, maybe I just had forgotten that part. Did it actually grab the cup and drink first? Right. And, and uh, you know, as a follow-up to that, I would wonder, you know, if you if you provoke one of these things by making them ill, um, I would think that your life expectancy has just been diminished. <laughs> Drastically. <laughs> yeah, not a good move. <laughs> well, I, w I was going to say here that I actually watched a, a video of... Um, um, a macaque and it was a baby macaque and a little long tail macaque and somebody fed them put ghost peppers out just just to see if they would eat them well of course the baby walked over immediately and popped one in its mouth and uh, then started freaking out but strangely enough um, the first thing it did was run back to mama and it kept nursing on the mother and then and then, of course, rubbing its mouth and pulling at its mouth to make sure that it got everything out of its mouth. Um, but it kept going, kept going back to its mother to nurse on it to, uh, I guess, uh, wash that taste out with milk. So they do have some uh, realization that water and milk probably would get rid of whatever that nasty taste was in their mouth. Actually, that was a very good move because milk actually will block in the tongue some of those right. uh, receptors yeah i'm sure he didn't realize that but it, it worked because it it wasn't too short uh short a period of time after that that the little guy finally returned to his normal behavior 
you know, and I've heard, I've had people tell me time and again, well, water doesn't help, it actually makes it worse. And I'm like, then why, you know, for in my personal experience, when I get something real hot and I drink water, at least for that instant, it's helping. <laughs> Correct. <It's, laughs> and, you know, going off topic a little bit, um, there's a video out there where there was somebody who had actually, they had a chimp, a pet chimp, <clears throat> And they train the thing to smoke cigars and drink beer. And I don't know if either one of you have seen that or. That's Oliver. Oh, you, you, okay. So you know which one it is. Then. <laughs> yeah. Oh, is well, that? There may be more than there may be more than one, but Oliver, he <clears throat> he was actually addicted to cigarettes. He would beg cigarettes, and and they sent him down to uh, South Texas down here at the. Um, the primate center he was down there and i think i'm sure he's probably deceased by now but he would beg cigarettes off of people and they allowed him to smoke he was addicted the monkey junkie (laughs) 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 well they have habits just like we do you know (laughs) well it is a good point did he beg for beer (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> hey, I've seen that on, well, on. No, I actually saw him drinking whiskey at one point in time out of a, a you know, a, a rocks glass. I mean, he was drinking alcohol. I mean, <laughs> hard alcohol. I can. He pic- may have liked beer as well. I can picture it, Tom. You know, him standing out on the on the freeway entrance with a sign that says "We'll work for beer." <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll work harder for whiskey. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so so getting back to Ostman, that is a good point, though. I mean, you have to wonder, um, and I kind of wonder too about, you know, they they would, you know, give the thing a little bit of snuff. Why would it take that in the, at all? You know, before it led up, to, he led up to the um, escape. <laughs> you know, I'm sure something you know, right. something with hands that big. How's it going to take a little pinch? I mean, maybe just a, a taste or something on its finger. I, I don't know. You know, <laughs> um, back in my uh, younger years, I actually um, I dabbled with uh, chewing tobacco at one point. And I got to tell you, that is some wretched stuff. <laughs> and if you swallow it. <laughs> I have a good friend that used to offer me that all the time when we were we were both privates in the army first our first year in and and i looked at it and i said you know that stuff looks like worm dirt you know you go you go buy worms for bait to go fishing i said that looks like right? worm dirt why do i want to put that in my lip <laughs> and i bet the worm dirt tastes better i mean this stuff is bad <laughs> well I, i'm not sure yeah, i'm not sure what what austin had or i i just Personally, I don't buy the story. I really don't. There's just too many things, <clears throat> especially when we researched the sleeping bag issue. Um, to me, that was that was enough. Well, don't you think that maybe um, that the snuff in his period of time was, I mean, uh, what we think of snuff now, we think of uh, Levi Garrett and such as that, which they come in the shreds. Uh, back then, they had the powdered snuff. Right. Uh, I don't think they had the shredded stuff like what we uh, sell now. Uh, you, in fact, you very rarely ever see snuff like, because I actually had a great aunt, and bless her heart, that woman lived to be uh, 99 and uh, <laughs> almost 100. She she lived within uh, two weeks of her 100th birthday, and she dipped snuff the whole time, but she dipped, uh, uh, and it was made by Levi Garrett, and it was... Uh, uh, but it came in a, a small canister with a silver top, and uh, it was powder, powdered. So don't you think that maybe what he had was more something like I, along those lines? I get the impression of that from the story because he talks about it being in a tin. Yeah, that would that would make more sense to me. Yeah. But right. I don't know how it would have gotten finger into one of those tiny tiny tins anyway. I don't either. I really don't. I mean... They're not real, they're not real, they weren't real big, at least the ones that I ever saw that uh, my uh, aunt had. You know, I always think about the nuts and bolts of these stories. 
like we talked about with a sleeping bag, you know, went back and did research on a sleeping bag. Was it feasible for a man and all this gear to be packed for miles in hilly terrain through the forest and dragged at points and to be able to come to its destination completely intact with all the gear? I, I don't find that feasible. But And then, like we talk about the size of these tins and then the size of a Sasquatch's hand and fingers, they're quite large. Um, I, I've got photographs of, of finger marks in clay that I've t- uh, found and took. And the fingers are, you know, an inch and a half wide. You know, that's a pretty large yeah, finger. Like yeah, yeah. And I, I don't think they have the same <clears throat> articulation with their hands that we do. And certainly, uh, probably not the... And it's a, it's a thing people don't understand. You have to have the software that goes along with that tool to be able to operate it like we do. And, and whether they have the brain capacity to do that uh, is unknown. Well, you know, primates, uh, gorillas and uh, chimpanzees are uh, very adept at opening jars, and I've even seen macaques do that. They they know how to open up, uh, uh, take off lids off of um, plastic soft drink bottles and um, pop open uh, pop tops off of uh, cans and such. They, they learn those behaviors from watching us. Um, and how to manipulate the the items, but um, I just don't think they had. I don't know. I get. I guess that it wouldn't have been a screw top on one, one of those things like that. It probably just have popped off. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Not having ever been able to see one of those things. I guess it's one and, of those things to go back and look at the early 1920s and see what those items actually were. Yeah, it's kind of like the the. Um, sleeping bag issue with him i mean i don't even know what sleeping bags in those days whether they were buttoned up or uh well tom, something that, tom and you know. i did some research on that and they were actually you know they they called them a sleeping bag but they were sort of glorified bed rolls um and, and they did have buttons or snaps they didn't have zippers so I, I, in fact tom i don't think the zippers on sleeping bags were introduced <clears throat> excuse me until around World War II, wasn't it? Yeah, I believe I believe that's correct. Actually, the beginning of World War II, they had the sleeping bags with the snaps on them. Right, right. Um, I don't even when was the zipper invented. The zipper's been around actually since what the eighteen sixties, I think, or prior, but it wasn't that's used good. in some of those well, items. Well, and that would make sense because. You know, the military wants to go for reliability and, you know, the zippers, I don't know how big they were. I mean, now we've got some pretty elaborate, hefty zippers, but even those give out over time. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, I've had some where you zip it up and you're like, oh, no, I got to take this down and get a new zipper on it. Yeah, the sleeping bags so, are notorious for that. They get off track. <laughs> yeah, they get off track and then there you go. So for, so for me, I had that question. I thought, well, let me think about the mechanics of this. You know, the story and parts of the story, of course, were John Green asked him. And he did swear an affidavit, but that doesn't mean anything because who's going to go verify the story, right? Um, but Green asked him if he would swear to the facts of the story. And he said, oh, just the main elements, but not the details. And for those of us that actually seen these creatures... I don't think there are many details that you forget in these encounters. So that was kind of the first red flag for me. Then I thought, well, let's let's look at the details. What were sleeping bags like back then? Because for this story to have happened, that had to be that had to be workable. And to me, after looking at the details, that part of the story was not workable at all. Well, wasn't there somebody else out there that uh, after? his uh, adventure with them that claimed that he had a similar incident occur? I don't recall off the top of my head. I can't remember the man's name, but I I think there was somebody else that was trying to say that, uh, uh, and it's been in the fairly modern times that was claiming that he had some sort of similar incident. And I can't remember the guy's name, but I'll have to look it up. You know, looking at the history, and we do the midweek show that's Bigfoot in history 
And to my knowledge, there hasn't been any other situation like that one. I mean, that is that is so standalone that it makes it not very believable because, and as you very well know, primate behavior is, is basically predictable because they all kind of do the same things, and they'll do them over and over again. Exactly. You know, and another thought on that is even if there or I'm not going to say even well, assuming that there is this other story which is not a mirror image but has a lot of the same elements in it the Osman story has been out for quite a while so somebody could take that and you know use that as the uh, basis for a, for a whole new story and even Ivan Sanderson remarked on that about uh, Osman's story from 1924 there was enough information out there that he could have he could have utilized some of these pieces to make the story sound real. Sure. Okay. And why wouldn't you yeah. have somebody with an imagination uh, back then as you do today, <laughs> and the same motivation? You know, again, I I, I think uh, Osman should have uh, written short fictional stories. Yeah, absolutely. All right, what do we have next, Tom? Well, I've got one here, and I'm just going to kind of sort of summarize the question. But he wants to know if um, what do you feel the Bigfoot, that Bigfoot, and the chance that it could be a new species discovery, uh, the Dragon Man that was found in 1933 that lived in East Asia. Uh, 146,000 years ago came over on the same ice bridge that Gigantopithecus may have traveled on. So I think what he's asking is could there have been a is Gigantopithecus separate from from Bigfoot? And, I, and if, I got, if I got that wrong Sean, uh, please shoot me an email and uh, we'll, re we'll revisit this question. I think we'll defer this one to Forrest and she's an anthropologist. Uh, okay, I'm not, I'm not refer I'm sure what he's referring to as Dragon Man. I'm not familiar with that terminology, but uh, Gigantopithecus is, uh, they uh, believe is more akin to an orangutan. Um, and if... Um, I'm thinking that a orangutan would probably have remained in, um, if it was, if it was in fact uh, kin to an orangutan, um, it would have remained in a tropical region. But if, oh. we have so many, we have so many animals that traveled over that uh, land bridge there in the Bering Straits that it would not be unthinkable that that a primate would have done so as well and I mean you know at one point in time at one point in time all of the the land masses were connected to so uh, you also have the situation that they may have in fact originated here and then moved out outwards I mean the horse they say originated in uh, the new world what is considered the new world but in fact it went back across the other way back across the the of the land bridge and populated you know the rest of the world so and then was not here at all when uh the white man came yeah so they brought the horse with them as it as, as the horse as it is at it exists today came with white people over the ocean when they settled America. That's true. I, so, I had a professor yeah, who that, was... Uh, they were going, animals were going back and forth yeah, all the time. Yeah, I had a professor, that was her specialty, was um, <clears throat> ancient horses in the Americas. And and I can tell you from when I was stationed at Fort Lewis, there were other things here too that don't exist anymore, like camels. Um, we had a oh, captain who wanted yeah. us to go out and find him wagon wheels. So we didn't have a lot to do in this particular couple of weeks, so we were flying around eastern Washington looking for wagon wheels. And when I'd have the, the pilot set the helicopters down, you know, we'd send the guys out and search. And one of the guys came back with this fossilized tooth, and it was about, geez, three to four inches long and about an inch across, about an inch thick. And um, 
we found out that that was an ancient camel tooth. So there's things that were here that aren't here anymore, and like you said, vice versa. I think he was referring to the other other species as Meganthropus. Meganthropus. Yeah, that's okay. a, supposed to be a new find of a, a giant hominid. I, I don't think I don't know much about well, that. I'd, you know, I'll, I'll plead ignorance on that as well because there's been a lot of uh, new finds. I have to keep reading all the time because there have been so many things that have been, uh, you know, discovered since I went to school. And uh, without telling you how old I am, which you all know, uh, I'm ancient as well. So uh, pretty soon I'll be probably reading about me in the books. But uh, um you know, it, you got to keep up on that stuff all the time. And the tragedy of it, too, with, uh, you know, these discoveries is that uh, they don't get published immediately because they have to go through a myriad of tests from different um, academia. And it takes a long time for them to get to be presented to the world as, you know, um, you know, a distinct species, or it could be just, you know, you know, it's kind of like the T. Rex. With, um, for example, that they they tried to come up with and say that there was different species of uh, T. Rex, and now they're saying, well, no, it was just a, a sexual dimorphism. So, um, you know, oh, that's interesting. I, I just looked up Meganthropus for listeners. Uh, it's listed as a. This was found in 1948 in. Let's see, in Indonesia. So it's listed as an extinct an extinct genus of non hominid ape. So I'm, I don't know if they're that's an old um, listing because I think they're they're trying to call everything hominids now. But um, anyway, I, I don't know how that relates or would relate. I to, would I would think it's probably something like an orangutan. Uh, yeah, right being in that area yeah and orangutans don't figure in um really into the uh direct lineage of us and but they they do at the uh the orion tongue genesis um that they found in tanzania um they actually show that or believe that to be a one of the first beginnings of bipedalism and um, they haven't actually figured it into our lineage but at 6.5 million years ago it was actually showing bipedalism and they think that it was <clears throat> akin to the orangutan because the orangutans bipedally walk on trees and across limbs and such by using their hands above them and then they walk across the, the, the limbs and this particular ape species did the same thing and they know that it was bipedal due to the the muscle and ligatures uh, uh, and the wrapping around the head of the femur it had an outward bow like a, a, a human femur and then the head of the femur showed the the proper muscle attachment that would have uh, uh, expressed bipedalism oh that's interesting you know the the question asked. He wanted to know if I think he wanted to know Tom didn't he if the if that um, the Gigantopithecus and this other creature were related. And they may be because the Gigantopithecus was from that you know Eastern Asia area too, and it was probably you know every some of the current thinking is that well you know the Gigantopithecus crossed over into America and that's Bigfoot and it's not that, that's a different creature. Let me ask a little follow up on that. What, how much physical evidence do we now have of Gigantopithecus? I remember at one point that I think there was just um, a partial jawbone and a tooth. No, no. Uh, Originally, it was a, a scientist named von Koenigswald in 1935 went to China and he found 35 teeth in a market. Yeah, they've got a lot of teeth and a partial jawbone, but they don't really have much more than that. They don't have any lower limbs or anything. Yeah. And the the problem being in China uh, with uh, the fossil finds in China is that the Chinese have this strange notion that uh, you grind up these fossil bones and then they use them for medicinal purposes. And um, it's really 
God only knows how much uh, has been lost to, uh, you know, the Chinese doing that. You know, it's odd, too, because if it's fossilized or fully fossilized, it's actually stone. <laughs> it's not the original yeah. The original bio, <laughs> biological material exactly. is gone. Yeah, that's what I was yeah. thinking. It's, you get a nice mineral content, and that's probably about <laughs> that's mineral right. supplements. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. All right, here's one, and this might go in the direction of for Forrest, but this is Corey. Corey says, uh, love love the podcast, wondering if those pictures, if we had more pictures from New Mexico, and I think Corey's referring to when you went down with TW, so I'll see if I can post something on the website. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, believe it or not, there seems to be a lot of sightings between here and San Antonio, and so between Austin and San Antonio. <laughs> Forrest, do you have any thoughts on that? As to why there is, um, well, have you heard of I any can, sightings? Well, can, uh, well, actually, uh, there is a sighting, and if people want to go out there, they can actually hear this. On it was in San Antonio. They had people in San Antonio, and um, my daughter actually, at one point in time, uh, lived in this particular area, and she was the first one that heard about this, and uh, we looked it up on the internet and found the actual 911 call where they had people calling in saying that there was this ape-like creature dragging a dead deer across the road and now this <laughs> particular road out there is a um if i remember correctly i think it's a full lane you know very busy thoroughfare and uh this thing was pulling a dead deer off the you know roadkill off the road and it was out into the woods and then the next thing they get <clears throat> is a uh, absolutely terrified call from two people that were, it was a man and a woman that camped out in this area. They were homeless people, but they had a tent and had a little setup out there on this land. And um, they were camping there and they saw this thing. Actually, it was looking over, uh, I don't know whether it was a clothesline or, or, or what that they had erected. And uh, <clears throat> it might have just been a, a tarp, you know, uh, providing shade. But this thing was actually looking over um, at them, and they were terrified. And they were calling, asking for the uh, police to please get out there. That the, you know, they didn't know, they had no weaponry, nothing to defend themselves. And I don't think the uh, the Bigfoot ever did anything, but. They were scared, and they actually, I mean, it, the the 911 call is actually out there. You can actually go look it up, and um, uh, and that uh, is would have been northwest of uh, San Antonio there. Um, there has uh, been another, and I know exactly where this house was um, because I had seen it. It's between, it's north of San Antonio as well, beautiful Spanish-type home, <clears throat> And there's a guy named Bob Gimlin, and I hope y'all don't get mad for me uh, <laughs> in suggesting that people go listen to this stuff, but um, he actually did a story on this um, occurrence because the man sent it to him. And um, this Are thing you talking about the up, Bob Gimlin? He spells with a Y No, of I'm I. not talking. It is. Uh, huh? It's not the same Bob Gimlin with the Patterson. His his name is Bob Gimlin, but he spells it with a G Y M rather than a G I M. Yeah, it's just and a screen he name. Spells his name differently. Yeah, is it a screen name? I, I, I don't know sure what the is, man's yeah. actual name is. Uh, but uh, he he actually did a story about they couldn't. This uh, this couple had purchased this home and. Um, they couldn't understand why this home had been evacuated, and I mean that the whoever had lived there had gone off and left Rolex watches and and uh, various sundry expensive items in the home and just left it and never came back. And they purchased the house for a, a, a song and then got in and started doing remodeling. And then after they started having experiences there. They sold the home as well, and I guess the the young man that uh, was their son, 
he actually came and took care of their dogs. Um, and that's when he had his experiences there. And um, the, they had their they they had erected uh, high ten foot chain link fences around their their yard and had a gate that was uh, going in. It was a Spanish type home, so they had a, like an alcove right there at, before the front door. And a lot of homes around here do that. It's kind of like a little fenced in, uh, you know, usually with stonework and then a, a, a gate. And this thing was like a, an enormous wooden gate, uh, you know that you might have erected at a fortress or something and this gate was actually broken while he was uh, staying there so uh, that is one particular incident um, I'm sure there's probably more that I'll think of uh, <laughs> let me let me break in a, let me break in a second question <laughs> let me break in a second there was something that okay. that you said that kind of triggered something in my thinking um about people abandoning their homes because of these things i know of a number of these situations and one even that i don't know if it was bigfoot related but i'll I'll tell it um and tom this is in the area where um my friend john lived where you know we found the footprints for the first time in 1972 and um you know the the guts and all that stuff wasn't very far from there Mm -hmm. just a few hundred yards there was this little house and it was it was overgrown it had been abandoned for a long long time i mean probably decades because there was so much you know the glass was all gone and things like that and i mean it was in a pretty advanced state of decay the whole house was so you know as as kids or or young teenagers me and a couple friends used to go over there to look it over and there was no other houses around it uh, except just forest and um there were plates and glasses and things still on the kitchen table like they were having a meal and simply got up and walked out um you know i uh it cracks me up when uh forrest when you're talking about this homeless couple out there gosh why would you be afraid of one of these things well i'll tell you about the homeless (laughs) thing too you know we have a a good friend Dwayne, whose mother lives in kalama and she listens to the um scanner all the time and they get a lot of reports from homeless people on the Kalama River about these things and and the police sometimes will go oftentimes they don't because they think oh they're just crazy people but uh the other one abandoning places you know we found in Yakult when when that idiot PhD went out there and, and disrupted the entire behavior patterns and made that group of creatures angry and they went to the neighboring farm and tore up their garden and the people simply left they abandon their place so it's well, not as uncommon well, as you think it is no 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 not at all we uh well you and i know somebody a guy named joe mm-hmm. and here in oregon and some folks that he knows they had their retirement home beautiful area i know the area very well i used to drive by it all the time and he it's next to a lake And he had a barn attached to the house, and he walks out one day in daylight, is my understanding, walks around the corner, and here's this eight-foot red hairy thing glaring at him. Uh, And he said the house went up on the market immediately. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's... Time time to move. it, It happens. You know, people don't realize that depending on the kind of encounter, et cetera, you know, people will simply walk away from their property. Yeah, well, and part of the problem was they they called the uh, local sheriff's office. A deputy came out and he said, oh, yeah. Well, he told him, he said, this is actually more common than you might imagine. We get a lot of these types of calls. And I think it was at that point they were like, okay, this isn't going away, (laughs) but we are. Right. Well, and you can't discount, and and Tom and I have had a conversation about this, and uh, tell me if you don't want me to bring this up, Tom. Um, those <clears throat> that information that I sent you about. Um, we've had a lot of people die in mysterious deaths, and I, I have listened to them. Um, uh, there was a homeless man north of here that they found in the brush, and they have no idea how he perished, except that. 
uh, they couldn't they couldn't uh, determine that it was any type of feral dogs, coyote activity, or anything else, but yet uh, his throat was ripped out, and um, um, oh, I believe, yeah, and and well, that, and, that, know, that sounds like that lady too uh, in 2019. That a woman, that you... a woman in Anawak, yes, yeah, and um, <clears throat> and the family still does not believe that wild hogs did it, and then you've got the little boy that uh, that died from the the corgi up in, um, uh, I believe it was either northern Texas or southern Oklahoma. I'd have to go actually look that up. And then there was just one that just recently uh, occurred here in Dallas, and it was also, uh, that that's the one I, I think I sent you last night uh, or the day before. And, you know, these mysterious deaths, I'm not saying they're necessarily big Bigfoot, Bigfoot, but I do think that, you know, like we, we discussed, that there is another variety of them out there that I think that are more baboon-like, and I think they're far more vicious, and uh, they don't wouldn't hesitate to uh, take a human. So, um, you know, that's just my opinion, folks, uh, and, you know, you know what opinions are. So, um. <laughs> Well, it's, it's a good opinion. It's, it's very interesting. <laughs> So, um, yeah, there's, there's, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of, but this is the, the key point is again, why is it when people see these things, not a single credible witness, uh, doesn't come back with a sense of dread. Well, I've changed my behavior around here. I mean, I was a woman that didn't care any, it didn't worry me in the least to walk out in the dark or, uh, you know, walk down to my barn in the dark. I won't do that anymore, Tom. I won't do that anymore, Will. And y'all know why. And right. oh, uh, yeah. I, my my dogs are even. Uh, I, I told you how Lagatha uh, has acted, and I've got a big Belgian Malinois, and who <laughs> she she doesn't run down there in the dark uh, anymore. So well, she was misbehaving I mean, last night, right? Uh, yes, she was, and when I uh, uh, <laughs> and the night before the I saw my little lineup, plastic lineup. Uh, that was a night that she was acting very peculiar, peculiarly too, and I for, completely forgot about that when uh, I was telling y'all the story of coming out the next morning and finding all the plastic lined up because I had difficulty getting her to come in because she kept spinning around. She came from down there around the barn, and it wasn't. I mean, it was. Uh, I'm, it wasn't dark, dark, but it was dark enough that I wasn't going to go down there. And I kept calling her and she kept spinning around and then looking back and then she was barking. Now that wasn't the way she would act if there was a, a, a raccoon or a possum down there. Uh, and then at, she did it three times on her way back up to the house. And the last time she just turned around and growled. And then, I mean, she practically knocked me down coming up. To the, and she was actually pawing at the door. I have in my interior doorknobs in the house are those flip doorknobs that uh, they actually have a handle and you turn them down. Uh, the doorknob on the uh, house is actually a regular doorknob. And she was trying to get it to, to flip so that she could get back in the house. She wanted at that point, she was like, uh, I'm going in the house, mom, you want to stay out here? That's fine. But I'm going in the house. So uh, that was when I, I closed the gate and hurried back in with her. So, you know, yeah, I, I, my it, behavior has changed, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it does that. And uh, <laughs> I I used to love to go camping. Yeah, I still love the outdoors, but not sure I want to go take my little pup tent and just go solo camping anymore. Tom, you don't want to be a burrito? I'm, I'm ashamed. No. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> No, I know what you both mean. I just don't run as fast as I used to. (laughs) (laughs) But you don't have to run fast to bring somebody you can trip. (laughs) Well, that's that's kind of like my friend Chuck that always wants me to go (laughs) researching with him. I said, wait till I get well enough that I can outrun you. (laughs) Well, Tom, what are we looking on in the way of questions? Well, we've got uh, one question from Roger and he wants to know if uh, 
he wants to know that these do these things uh, do they eat bugs off of trees and I don't know um uh, why wouldn't they? I suppose if they wanted to, they could. But yeah, I mean, grizzlies eat it, butterflies, so <laughs> you know that was something I, I, I didn't saw. know that. Well, I saw a show. I think it was National Geographic where they were talking about how in Yellowstone, in the middle of summer, the grizzlies will all virtually vanish, and they couldn't figure out for years where the grizzlies were going, until they found that these big swarms of monarch butterflies were coming through at that time of year, and that's where the grizzlies were. They were where the butterflies were. They were eating them. Apparently, they're high in protein. So, seems like a lot of work. You would think, but <laughs> hey, you know, if it's an easy meal, go for it. Well, getting off topic. Bugs. Do they? Yeah, they do. Yeah. Well, I've they, seen they pick videos. They off the trees, off the ground, and eat them. Well, talking about tool usage with primates, I've seen where chimps will use a stick and put it into an ant hill to get the ants and then just, you know, eat them. Yeah, they fish out termites that way. They stick a, a long, thin stick, and they will actually, they will hunt till they find the right stick and then strip all the leaves off of it and then stick it down in the termite mounds, and then the, the termites will attach to the uh, uh, stick, and then they'll just take them and run them through their mouth and eat the termites that way. When yeah. And it's, it's a learned behavior, and uh, who's to say the first chimp was that decided to, to do that, but uh, the baby chimpanzees will sit there and watch the, uh, their siblings and their uh, parents do it, and they will uh, copy their behavior. Now, I haven't enough, learned that. Gorillas, gorillas do not do that. I don't do it either. Um, <laughs> well, I, I don't either. <laughs> I, I, I will tell you, <laughs> there's a guy who had a bushcraft uh, website or channel, I should say. And I watched him on one of his camping videos. And he finds this rotten log. He tears it open. And he finds, I believe it was termites. And he's eating them. And he said, they're really sweet. They're like little bits of candy. But uh, I couldn't <laughs> tell you if they are or not. And, you know, bears will tell, tear rotten trees apart just to get to the bugs. So that seems like a lot of effort for small reward, but they do it. They well, must and, be tasty. And have, yes, and they've actually had sightings of uh, Bigfoot doing the same thing, you know. Oh, yeah. We've got, we've got plenty of examples of it we found. Yeah, aboriginals uh, in uh, Australia uh, actually hunt for these big huge tree grubs and i mean they're big i mean they can practically fill up your hand and they eat them uh they eat them alive they they toast them they and then you know they they relish them i mean it's not a food source that i think i would go after but i guess if i was hungry enough i might <laughs> yeah very true very true and and you look at some of those grubs and they have that sectional body no oh i know <laughs> <laughs> no i don't want to go there <laughs> see how picky uh, we are these days <laughs> yeah well you know <laughs> food's gonna get scarce boys <laughs> i heard that last night food's gonna become scarce Well, do we have any other questions, Tom? Or I think that's all we have this week. But I do want to say uh, I want to thank everybody for sending in their questions. And please keep them coming. They keep the topic alive and interesting. Send them to questions at creekdevil.com. And again, we answer them on the air so that everybody gets the benefit of your questions. All right. Um, oh, go ahead. I do want to. I, I just want to um, mention quickly. You know, talking about the uh, the so the primates digging for bugs and the bears eating the butterflies. This is an interesting one. It's a little off topic, but uh, I've seen videos of people hiking to the top of Mount Jefferson here in Oregon, which is 
10,000 and some change in altitude, elevation, I should say. And there's butterflies all over the place up there flying around. Who'd, who would have thought? What are they doing up there? Well, that's a good question. I don't really know what, no their, um, what their behaviors are, but... Uh, we got a few minutes left. I'm going to take there a look. There is no cryptid uh -oh. who's captivated more minds. Okay, let's see. I'm going to take a look at some of the comments we have. We'll try to address some of those as we can. Um, my computer decides it's going to work. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, while you're doing that, I'm going to ask Forrest a question about the... Uh, you had mentioned a couple episodes back talking about the um, tree climbing abilities of chimps and that you felt that Bigfoot was probably a boreal creature with feet that go along with that. Are you saying the feet would be heavily padded and they might actually cushion the sound as they're walking on, on the ground? You know, when they step on a dry twig, it's not going to have that loud crack like we have with shoes or boots, but they're actually going to muffle it. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think they probably have padding on the feet like a dog or a cat does. Uh, and that would only stand to reason as much uh, walking as they do in the forest type situation. Um, <coughs> I had suggested that they could be a boreal, um, you know, uh, goes back to me always talking to my TV and suggesting to uh, the not finding Bigfoot crew, look in the trees, look in the trees, which they never did as far as I know. Uh, and because you always hear them talking about the um, length of arm. Now, in my sightings, I he, he was way too close to, and I say he, only by virtue of the size of the thing, because um, <laughs> I didn't see any genitalia either. But and I didn't see the length of the arm either as and, and ratio to the um, uh, the legs. But um, it goes back to um, scientists do a um, humeral femoral index with uh, uh, all primates. And it basically, without going into too much uh, technology here, it what it does is it, it's a, a ratio of the length of the arm as in uh, uh, relation to the uh, uh, overall body uh, body proportions and the length of the femur. And the higher the index, which would be longer the arms, the more likely the primate is going to be arboreal. And um, <clears throat> um, the ratio on like chimps is 97.8 percent and with humans it's uh if i remember correctly it was uh uh around 72 percent and so um you see where humans our our uh arms and legs are uh more more proport more proportioned than uh, our legs are longer than our our arms are and if you have a quadrupedal animal, its legs are going to almost be the same uh, length in the front as they are in the back. So uh, the the length of arm, when it's greater than the length of the leg, uh, basically indicates to you an arboreal animal. See, I've got a comment here, folks, that's very interesting. And it regards in regards to sweet feed. Oh, darn it. Curtis is calling, so we'll have to wait just a moment. I can't, he's right in the middle where I, can, I can't get this. Okay, let me try to read this. Um, this is from PJG Fountain. hope I pronounced that correctly. He says, or she says, back about 50 years ago, my grandpa used to keep his sweet feed for his horses in an old chest-type freezer. It was outside and under a lean-to type structure in his pasture. We lived out west and were down south visiting family when he told us twice he had to get his tractor and drag the freezer back to the lean-to because a bear had dragged it down to the end of the pasture. As a kid, I didn't think a bear would be dragging or pushing question marks, a chest freezer full of sweet feed. 
and I thought a creature like the Falk Monster must have done it, but Grandpa flat out refused to think such a thing existed. That was rural Arkansas, Lonsdale area, early 1970s. My grandpa used to take off and go into the woods and be gone for days, sometimes weeks, as a younger man. He never saw a Sasquatch and thought people were imagining it, the Falk Monster. We mentioned the creature uh, in Legend of Boggy Creek. So that's interesting. I mean, a whole chest freezer full of this stuff. Hmm. Well, you know, since we put the chains on the, the barn door, we haven't had any uh, uh, problems. Yeah, I was I was thought about you right away when when uh, that guy I read that because I thought, wow, you know, they're going in. This these guys are just dragging the whole chest freezer off full of the stuff. <laughs> but you know, it also Why take it out by a handful. We'll just take the whole thing. <laughs> right. And you know, but even when I had my first sighting, you know, our barn was right there next to those woods, right next to the spot, maybe maybe a hundred feet away from where I actually encountered the creatures. And that side of the barn was all open, facing the tree line. And we had a lot of feed out there for the cattle and pigs and everything, so it, it had to be a draw, a natural draw. You could smell the stuff for the pigs a long ways away. Oh, yeah, the sweet feed uh, actually, uh, <clears throat> I don't feed strictly sweet feed, but I feed a pelleted form, and it, it does have the molasses in it, so it does a, it has a sweet taste. But you can walk into a barn where they're feeding sweet feed, and you can smell that molasses. And, I mean, it has a, a very distinct, uh, uh, pleasant odor. So, you know, and, and primates have a, a, I mean, all primates. I'm not discounting any of them. Uh, probably even the lower uh, forms like the simians have a sweet tooth. Oh, yeah, I'm sure the molasses like in it does a natural mm-hmm. draw. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. All right, we're just about out of time, folks, for this segment. So um, stand by. We'll be right back. In Bigfoot history, Strawberry near Angels Camp, Northern California, March 1963. Mrs. Linda Campbell, Aloha, Oregon, phoned me on an open radio line show in Portland to say that on their honeymoon, at Jack and Jill Ski Lodge, she and her new husband saw an eight to nine foot upright shaggy creature while they were on a hike. It ran off on its hind legs, they told the lodge owners, who said they had seen the same animal previously. Dreams in the night, Indian legends, miles of footprints, sightings. What are these elusive hominids that stalk the wilderness? Join us for eyewitness accounts, questions and answers, Bigfoot encounters of the past, and ongoing encounters in the present. Your host, two-time witness, field researcher for 43 years, William Jevning. Welcome to the mystery. Welcome to... Creek Devil. Greetings. This story is being brought to you by William Jevning and is being narrated by Jim Sower. This is a story from Albert Ostman. I have always followed logging and construction work. This time I had worked over one year on a construction job and thought a good vacation was in order. British Columbia is famous for lost gold mines. One is supposed to be at the head of Toba Inlet. Why not look for this mine and have a vacation at the same time? I took the Union steamship boat to Lund, British Columbia. From there, I hired an old Indian to take me to the head of Toba Inlet. This Indian was a very talkative old gentleman. He told me stories about gold brought out by a white man from his lost mine. This white man was a very heavy drinker spent his money freely in saloons, but he had no trouble in getting more money. He would be away for a few days, then come back with a bag of gold. But one time he went to his mine and never came back. Some people said a Sasquatch had killed him. Now, at that time, I had never heard of a Sasquatch, so I asked what kind of an animal he called a Sasquatch. The Indian said, 
They have hair all over their bodies, but they are not animals. They are people, big people living in the mountains. My uncle saw the tracks of one that were two feet long. One old Indian saw one over eight feet tall. I told the Indian I didn't believe in their old fables about mountain giants. It might have been some thousands of years ago, but not nowadays. The Indian said, There may not be many, but they still exist. We arrived at the head of the inlet about four o'clock p.m. I made camp at the mouth of a creek. The Indian had supper with me, and I told him to look out for me in about three weeks. I would be camping at the same spot when I came back. Next morning, I took my rifle with me, but left my equipment at the camp. I decided to look around for some deer trail to lead me up into the mountains. On the way up the inlet, I had seen a pass in the mountain that I wanted to go through, to see what was on the other side. I spent most of the forenoon looking for a trail, but found none except for a hogback running down to the beach. So I swamped out a trail from there, got back to my camp about 3 o'clock p.m. that afternoon, and made up my pack to be ready in the morning. My equipment consisted of one thirty thirty Winchester rifle. I had a special homemade prospecting pick, axe on one end, pick on the other. I had a leather case for this pick which fastened to my belt, also my sheath knife. The storekeeper at Lund was cooperative. He gave me some cans for my sugar, salt, and matches to keep them dry. My grub consisted mostly of canned stuff, except for a side of bacon, a bag of beans, four pounds of prunes, and six packets of macaroni, cheese, three pounds of pancake flour, six packets of Rye King hardtack, three rolls of snuff, one quart sealer of butter, and two one-pound cans of milk. I had two boxes of shells for my rifle. The storekeeper gave me a biscuit tin. I put a few things in that and cashed it under a windfall, so I would have it when I came back here waiting for a boat to bring me out. My sleeping bag I rolled up and tied on top of my sack. Together, with all my ground sheet and frying pan, I had one aluminum pot that held about a gallon. And as my canned food was used, I would get plenty of empty cans to cook with. The following morning, I had an early breakfast, made up my pack, and started up this mountain hog back. My pack must have been at least 80 pounds, besides my rifle. After one hour, I had to rest. And I kept resting and climbing all that morning. About 2 p.m., I came to a flat place below a rock bluff. There was a bunch of willow in one place. I made a wooden spade and started digging for water. About a foot down, I got seepings of water, so I decided to camp here for the night and scout around for the best way to get on from here. I must have been up to near a thousand feet. There was a most beautiful view over the islands in the strait. Tugboats with log booms, fishing boats going in all directions, Oh, it was a lovely spot. I spent the following day prospecting round, but no sign of minerals. I found a deer trail leading towards this pass that I had seen on my way up the inlet. The following morning I started out early while it was cool. It was deep climbing with my heavy pack. After a three hours climb, I was tired and stopped to rest. On the other side of a ravine from where I was resting was a yellow spot below were some small trees. I moved over there and started digging for water. I found a small spring and made a small trough from cedar bark and got a small amount of water, had my lunch and rested here till evening. I made it over the pass late that night. Now I had downhill and good going, but I was hungry and tired, so I camped at the first bunch of trees I came to. I was trying to size up the terrain. What direction would I take from here? Toward west would lead to low land and some other inlet, so I decided to go in a northeast direction. Had good going and slight downhill all day. I must have made ten miles while I came to a small spring and a big black hemlock tree. This was a lovely campsite. I spent two days here just resting and prospecting. The first night here I shot a small deer. 
Two days later, I found an exceptionally good campsite. It was two good-sized cypress trees growing close together and near a rock wall with a nice spring just below these trees. I intended to make this my permanent camp. I cut lots of brush for my bed between these trees. I rigged up a pole from this rock wall to hang my pack sack on, and I arranged some flat rocks for my fireplace for cooking. I had a really classy setup. And that was when things began to happen. I am a heavy sleeper. Not much disturbs me after I go to sleep, especially on a good bed like I had now. Next morning, I noticed things had been disturbed during the night, but nothing missing I could see. I roasted my grouse on a stick for breakfast. That night, I filled up the magazine of my rifle. I still had one full box of twenty shells and six shells in my coat pocket. That night, I laid my rifle under the edge of my sleeping bag. I thought a porcupine had visited me the night before, and porkies like leather, so I put my shoes in the bottom of my sleeping bag. Next morning, my pack sack had been emptied out. Someone had turned the sack upside down. It was still hanging on the pole from the shoulder straps as I had hung it up. Then I noticed one half-pound package of prunes was missing. Also, my pancake flour was missing. But my salt bag was not touched. Now, porkies always look for salt, so I decided it must be something else than porkies. I looked for tracks but found none. I did not think it was a bear. They always tear up and make a mess of things. I kept close to camp these days in case the visitor would come back. I climbed up on a big rock where I had a good view of the camp, but nothing showed up. I was hoping it would be a porky, so I would get a good porky stew. These visits had now been going on for three nights. This night, it was cloudy, and looked like it might rain. I took special notice of how everything was arranged. I closed my pack sack. I did not undress. I only took off my shoes, put them in the bottom of my sleeping bag. I drove my prospecting pick into one of the cypress trees, so... I could reach it from my bed. I also put the rifle alongside me, inside my sleeping bag. I fully intended to stay awake all night to find out who my visitor was, but I must have fallen asleep. I was awakened by something picking me up. I was half asleep, and at first I did not remember where I was. As I began to get my wits together, I remembered I was on this prospecting trip, and in my sleeping bag. My first thought was, oh, must be a snow slide, but there was no snow around my camp. Then it felt like I was tossed on horseback, but I could feel whoever it was was walking. Now I tried to reason out what kind of animal this could be. I tried to get up my sheath knife and cut my way out, but I was in an almost sitting position and the knife was under me. I could not get hold of it but the rifle was in front of me. I had a good hold of that and had no intention to let it go. At times I could feel my pack sack touching me. I could feel the cans in the sack touching my back. After what seemed like an hour, I could feel we were going up a steep hill. I could feel myself rise for every step. What was carrying me was breathing hard and sometimes gave a slight cough. Now... I knew this must be one of the mountain Sasquatch giants the old Indian had told me about. I was in a very uncomfortable position, unable to move. I was sitting on my feet, and one of the boots in the bottom of the bag was crossways with the hobnail sole up across my foot. Oh, it hurt me terribly, but I could not move. It was very hot inside. It was lucky for me this fellow's hand was not big enough to close up the whole bag when he picked me up. There was a small opening at the top. Otherwise, I would have choked to death. Now he was going downhill. I could feel myself touching the ground at times, and at one time he dragged me behind him, and I could feel he was below me. Then he seemed to get on level ground and was going at a trot for a long time. By this time, I had cramps in my legs. Oh, the pain was terrible. I was wishing he would get to his destination. I 
could not stand this type of transportation much longer. Now he was going uphill again. It did not hurt me so bad. I tried to estimate distance and directions. As near as I could guess, we were about three hours traveling. I had no idea when he started, as I was asleep when he had picked me up. Finally, he stopped and let me down. Then he dropped my pack sack. I could hear the cans rattle. Then I heard chatter. Some kind of talk I did not understand. The ground was sloping, so when he let go of my sleeping bag, I rolled downhill. I got my head out and got some air. I tried to straighten my legs and crawl out, but my legs were numb. It was still dark. I could not see what my captors looked like. I tried to massage my legs to get some life in them and get my shoes on. I could hear now it was at least four of them. They were standing around me and continuously chattering. I had never heard of Sasquatch before the Indian had told me about them, but I knew I was right among them. But how to get away from here? That was another question. I got to see the outline of them now, as it began to get lighter. Though the sky was cloudy, and it looked like rain, in fact, there was a slight sprinkle. Oh, I now had circulation in my legs, but my left foot was very sore on top where it had been resting on my hobnail boots. I got my boots out from the sleeping bag and tried to stand up. I found that I was wobbly on my feet, but I had a good hold of my rifle. I asked, "'What you fellows want with me?' Only some more chatter. It was getting lighter now, and I could see them quite clearly. I could make out forms of four people, two big and two little ones. They were all covered with hair and no clothes on at all. I could now make out mountains all around me. I looked at my watch. It was 4.25 a.m. It was getting lighter now, and I could see the people clearly. They looked like a family, old man, old lady, and two young ones, a boy and a girl. The boy and the girl seemed to be scared of me. The old woman doesn't seem to be too pleased about what the old man dragged home. But the old man was waving his arms and telling them all what he had in mind. They all left me then. I had my prospecting glass and my compass around strings on my neck. The compass in my left-hand shirt pocket and my glass in my right-hand pocket. I tried to reason our location and where I was. I could see now that I was in a small valley or basin about eight or ten acres across, surrounded by high mountains. On the southeast wall there was a V-shaped opening about eight feet wide at the bottom and about twenty feet high at the highest point. That must be the way I came in. But how will I get out? The old man was now sitting near this opening. I moved my belongings up close to the west wall. There were two small cypress trees there, and this will do for a shelter for the time being. Until I find out what these people want with me, and how to get away from here, I emptied out my pack sack to see what I had left in the line of food. All my canned meat and vegetables were intact, and I had one can of coffee. Also, three small cans of milk, two packages of Rye King hardtack, and my butter sealer half full of butter but my prunes and macaroni were missing. Also, my full box of shells for my rifle. I had my sheath knife, but my prospecting pick was missing and my can of matches. I only had my safety box full, and that held only about a dozen matches. That did not worry me. I can always start a fire with my prospecting glass when the sun is shining, if I got dry wood. I wanted hot coffee, but I had no wood, also nothing around here that looked like wood. I had a good look over the valley from where I was, but the boy and the girl were always watching me from behind some juniper bush. I decided there must be some water around here. The ground was leaning towards the opening in the wall. There must be water at the upper end of this valley. There is green grass and moss along the bottom. All my utensils were left behind. I opened my coffee tin and emptied the coffee in a dish towel and tied it with the metal strip from the can. I took my rifle and the can and went looking for water. Right at the head, under a cliff, 
there was a lovely spring that disappeared underground. I got a drink and a full can of water. When I got back, the young boy was looking over my belongings, but did not touch anything. On my way back, I noticed where these people were sleeping. On the east side wall of this valley was a shelf in the mountainside with an overhanging rock, looking something like a big undercut in a big tree about ten feet deep and thirty feet wide. The floor was covered with lots of dry moss, and they had some kind of blankets woven of narrow strips of cedar bark, packed with dry moss. They looked very practical and warm, with no need of washing. The first day, not much happened. I had to eat my food cold. The young fellow was coming nearer me, and seemed curious about me. My one snuff-box was empty, so I relied it toward him. When he saw it coming, he sprang up quick as a cat and grabbed it. He went over to his sister and showed her. They found out how to open and close it. They spent a long time playing with it. Then he trotted over to the old man and showed him. They had a long chatter. Next morning, I made up my mind to leave this place, if I had to shoot my way out. I could not stay much longer. I had only enough grub to last me until I got back to Toba Inlet. I did not know the direction, but I would go downhill, and I would come out near civilization someplace. I rolled up my sleeping bag, put that inside my pack sack, packed the few cans I had, swung the sack on my back, injected the shell in the barrel of my rifle, and started for the opening in the wall. The old man got up, held up his hands as though he would push me back. I pointed to the opening. I wanted to go out. But he stood there pushing towards me, and said something that sounded like, Soka, Soka. I backed up to about sixty feet. I did not want to be too close, so I thought if I had to shoot my way out, a thirty thirty might not have much effect on this fellow. It might just make him mad. I only had six shells, so I decided to wait. There must be a better way than killing him in order to get out from here. I went back to my campsite to figure out some other way to get out. I could make friends with a young fellow or the girl. They might help me. If I only could talk to them. Then I thought of a fellow who had saved himself from a mad bull by blinding him with snuff in his eyes. But how will I get near enough to this fellow to put snuff in his eyes? So I decided next time to give the young fellow my snuff box and to leave a few grains of snuff in it. He might give the old man a taste of it. But the question is, in what direction will I go if I should get out? I must have been near twenty-five miles northeast of Toba Inlet when I was kidnapped. This fellow must have traveled at least twenty-five miles in the three hours he carried me. If he went west, we would be near salt water, and same thing if he went south. Therefore, he must have gone northeast. If I then kept going south and over two mountains, I must hit salt water someplace between Lund and Vancouver. The following day I did not see the old lady until about four o'clock p.m. She came home with her arms full of grass and twigs and all kinds of spruce and hemlock as well as some kind of nuts that grow in the ground. I have seen lots of them on Vancouver Island. The young fellow went up the mountain to the east every day, and he would climb better than a mountain goat. He picked some kind of grass with long, sweet shoots. He gave me some one day. Well, they tasted very sweet. I gave him another snuff box with about a teaspoon of snuff in it. He tasted it, then went to the old man. He licked it with his tongue. They had a long chat. I made a dipper from a milk can, and I made many dippers. You can use them for pots, too. You cut two slits near the top of any can, then cut a limb from any small tree, Cut down back of the limb, down the stem of the tree, then taper the part that you cut from the stem. Then cut a hole in the tapered part, slide the tapered part in the slit you have made in the can, and you have a good handle on your can. I threw one over to the young fellow that was playing near my camp. He picked it up and looked at it, and he went to the old man and showed it to him. They had a long chatter. 
Then he came to me, pointed at the dipper, then at his sister. I could see that he wanted one for her, too. I had other peas and carrots, so I made one for his sister. He was standing only eight feet away from me. When I had made the dipper, I dipped it in water and drank from it. He was very pleased, almost smiled at me. Then I took a chew of snuff, smacked my lips, mmm, said that's good. The young fellow pointed to the old man and said something that sounded like ook. I got the idea that the old man liked snuff and the young fellow wanted a box for the old man. I shook my head. I motioned with my hands for the old man to come to me. I do not think the young fellow understood what I meant. He went to his sister and gave her the dipper I made for her. They did not come near me again that day. I had now been there six days, but I was sure I was making progress. If only I could get the old man to come over to me. Get him to eat a full box of snuff, well, that would kill him for sure. And that way kill himself. Well, I wouldn't be guilty of murder. The old lady was a meek old thing. The young fellow was by this time quite friendly. The girl would not hurt anybody. Her chest was flat like a boy's, no development like young ladies. I am sure if I could get the old man out of the way, I could easily have brought this girl out with me to civilization. But what good would that have been? I would have to keep her in a cage for public display. I don't think we have any right to force our way of life on other people, and I don't think they would like it. The noise and racket in a modern city, well, they would not like it any more than I do. The young fellow might have been between 11 to 18 years old, and about 7 feet tall, and might weigh 300 pounds. His chest would be 50, 55 inches. His waist was about 36 to 38 inches. He had wide jaws, narrow forehead that slanted upward round at the back and about four or five inches higher than the forehead. The hair on their heads was about six inches long. The hair on the rest of their body was short and thick in places. The women's hair on the forehead had an upward turn like some women have, and they call it bangs among women's hairdos. Nowadays, the old lady could have been anything between forty to seventy years old. She was over seven feet tall. She would be about five to six hundred pounds. She had very wide hips and a goose-like walk. She was not built for beauty or speed. Some of those lovable brassieres and uplifts would have been a great improvement on her looks and her figure. The man's eye teeth were longer than the rest of the teeth, but not long enough to be called tusks. The old man must have been near eight feet tall, big barrel chest and big hump on his back. Powerful shoulders, his biceps on upper arm were enormous and tapered down to his elbows. His forearms were longer than common people have, but well proportioned. His hands were wide, the palm was long and broad and hollow like a scoop. His fingers were short in proportion to the rest of his hand. His fingernails were like chisels. The only place they had no hair was inside their hands and the soles of their feet and the upper part of the nose and eyelids. I never did see their ears. They were covered with hair hanging over them. If the old man were to wear a collar, it would have been uh, at least thirty inches. I have no idea what size shoes they would need. I was watching the young fellow's foot one day when he was sitting down. The soles of his feet seemed to be padded like a dog's foot, and the big toe was longer than the rest and very strong. In mountain climbing, all he needed was footing for his big toe. They were very agile. To sit down, they turned their knees out and came straight down. To rise, they came straight up without help of hands or arms. I don't think this valley was their permanent home. I think they move from place to place as food is available in different localities. They might eat meat, but I never saw them eat meat or do any cooking. I think this was probably a stopover place, and the plants with sweet roots in the mountainside might have been in season this time of the year. They seem to be most interested in them, and the roots have a very sweet and satisfying taste. They always seem to do everything for a reason. 
wasted no time on anything they did not need. When they were not looking for food, the old man and the old lady were resting, but the boy and the girl were always climbing something or some other exercise. A favorite position was to take hold of his feet with his hands and balance on his rump, then bounce forward. The idea seems to be to see how far he could go without his hands or feet touching the ground. <laughs> Sometimes he made twenty feet. But what do they want with me? They must understand I cannot stay here indefinitely. I will soon have to make a break for freedom. Not that I was mistreated in any way. One consolation was that the old man was coming closer each day and was very interested in my snuff. Watching me when I take a pinch of snuff, he seems to think it useless that I only put it inside my lips. One morning, after I had my breakfast, both the old man and the boy came and sat down only ten feet away from me. This morning I made coffee. I had saved up all the dry branches I found, and I had some dry moss, and I used all the labels from the cans to start a fire. I got my coffee pot boiling, and it was strong coffee, too, and the aroma from boiling coffee was what brought them over. I was sitting eating hardtack with plenty of butter on and sipping coffee. Oh, and it sure tasted good. I was smacking my lips, pretending it was better than it really was. I set the can down that was about half full. I intended to warm it up later. I pulled out a full box of snuff, took a big chew. Before I had time to close the box, the old man reached for it. I was afraid he would waste it and only had two more boxes, so I held on to the box, intending him to take a pinch like I had just done. Instead, he grabbed the box and emptied it into his mouth, swallowed it in one gulp. Then he licked the box inside with his tongue. After a few minutes, his eyes began to roll over in his head. He was looking straight up. I could see he was sick. Then he grabbed my coffee can that was quite cold by this time. He emptied that in his mouth, grounds and all. That did no good. He stuck his head between his legs and rolled forward a few times away from me. Then he began to squeal like a stuck pig. I grabbed my rifle, and I said to myself, This is it. If he comes for me, I will shoot him plumb between his eyes. But he started for the spring. He wanted water. I packed my sleeping bag in my pack sack with the few cans I had left. The young fellow ran over to his mother. Then she began to squeal. I started for the opening in the wall and I just made it. The old lady was right behind me. I fired one shot at the rock over her head. I guess she had never seen a rifle fired before. She turned and ran inside the wall. I injected another shell in the barrel of my rifle and started downhill, looking back over my shoulder every so often to see if they were coming. I was in a canyon, and good traveling, and I made fast time. Must have made three miles and some world record time. I came to a turn in the canyon, and I had the sun on my left. That meant I was going south, and the canyon turned west. I decided to climb the ridge ahead of me. I knew that must have two mountain ridges between me and salt water, and my climbing this ridge, I would have a good view of this canyon. So I could see if the Sasquatch were coming after me. I had a light pack and was making good time up this hill. I stopped soon after to look back to where I came from, but nobody had followed me. I came over the edge of the ridge, and I could see Mount Baker. Then I knew I was going in the right direction. I was hungry and tired. I opened my pack sack to see what I had to eat. I decided to rest here for a while. I had a good view of the mountainside, and if the old man was coming, I had the advantage because I was above him. To get me, he would have to climb up a steep hill, and that might not be so easy after stopping a few thirty-thirty bullets. I had made up my mind this was my last chance, and this would be a fight to the finish. I rested here for two hours. It was three o'clock p.m. when I started down the mountainside. It was nice going, not too steep, not too much underbrush. When I got near the bottom, I shot a big blue grouse. She was sitting on a windfall, looking right at me, only a hundred feet away. I shot her neck right off. 
I made it down the creek at the bottom of this canyon. I felt I was safe now. I made a fire between two big boulders, roasted the grouse. Next morning when I woke up, I was feeling terrible. My feet were sore from dirty socks. My legs were sore. My stomach was upset from the grouse that I'd eaten. I was not too sure I was going to make it up that mountain. I finally made the top, but it took me six hours to get there. It was cloudy, visibility about a mile. I knew I had to go downhill. After about two hours, I got down to the heavy timber and sat down to rest. I could hear a motor running hard at times, then stop. I listened to this for a while and decided the sound was from a gas donkey. Someone was logging in the neighborhood. I told them I was a prospector and was lost. I did not like to tell them I had been kidnapped by a Sasquatch, as if I had told them they would probably have said, He is crazy, too. The following day I went down from this camp on Salmon Arm Branch of the Seashelt Inlet. From there I got the Union boat back to Vancouver. That was my last prospecting trip, and my only experience with what is known as Sasquatches. I know that in 1924 there were four Sasquatches living. It might be only two now. The old man and the old lady might be dead by this time. That ends Albert Osman's story. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there. Welcome. This collection of five stories is being brought to you by William Jevning, and they are being narrated by me, Jim Sower. Story number one is a Bigfoot encounter in California from the Yuba Feather River area between Laporte and Quincy, California. Story number two, A Night in the Sierras. Number three, Butte County, Oroville, California. Number four, Wood County, Wisconsin. And number five, Strange Story, Clark County, Washington. Story number one. California's Yuba Feather River between Laporte and Quincy, California. I had a very up-close encounter in June 1988 on the North Fork of California's Great Feather River, between Laporte and Quincy, in a very isolated area. There is next to no traffic in this area. On this occasion, it was me and my two dogs by ourselves, and it was a very unnerving experience. I had hiked into this spot, on the North Fork of the Yuba and Feather Rivers, a place called Middle Fork. I found a spot near a tree line so I could tie my food up in a tree to keep the wildlife out of it. I made camp and cooked a few trout that I had caught earlier. The campfire was still burning lightly as I was getting a little tired, so I decided to turn in. It was about 9 p.m. and the fire was now just about out, just smoldering a little, so I didn't put any water on it. I just climbed into my tent and laid down on top of my bedroll. I let my dogs run around because they always stay close to camp, if not in the tent with me, and I started to doze off to the crickets chirping when suddenly I woke up and it was as if I had one of those dreams where you're falling. I could tell there was something very wrong. It was dead quiet. No crickets. Nothing. Nothing and my dogs came running into my tent, shaking. These dogs were very aggressive, usually. Not mean dogs, but would bark at anything that came around. One of them was a 95-pound pit bull. I was scared shitless, so I grabbed my rifle and pistol, along with a flashlight, and stepped outside the tent. I couldn't see anything, but I had that sensation of being watched. 
I grabbed some more firewood and threw it on the embers left from the dinner fire. Then I heard some very heavy footsteps right behind me in the trees. There was also a very strange odor, almost like a cross between a skunk and something dead. This thing circled my campsite all night long. Well, at first light, I packed up and started out, and this thing followed me almost the entire day. I could hear it, smell it, and even saw it through the woods about seventy-five yards away from me, taking an almost parallel trail to me as if to make sure that I left its territory. I never shot at it with my rifle, as I don't believe in killing things for sport. I've never gone back to that place, but I would love to go on an expedition back there with some other people. This is the end of story number one. Story number two. A Night in the Sierras. It was June 1988, and I'd been camping for three days in the eastern Sierra Nevada mountains. I was in my sleeping bag and listening to my shortwave radio at a loud volume. It was almost 9 p.m., and there'd just been an announcement for the Lone Ranger on radio station KNX. Only a few minutes before, a party of three went by on the trail, and I exchanged a few words with them about the local fishing. It was only moments later when a scream rang out that could turn your hair white. It was no further than 100 feet away from me, but out of my line of sight due to a nearby ranger snow survey cabin. I've never to this day heard anything even remotely like that sound, not even in the recorded sounds that Peter Gutierrez was kind enough to send to me. Despite the immediate trembling fear I felt, I got up and grabbed my six-volt flashlight and put the light to the ground ahead of me. I walked over to the trail in the direction of the sound. The size of what I saw running off toward the river almost makes me wish I'd never gone to look. I remember shaking, standing there, hearing it thrash through the small lodgepole pines and brush down by the creek. The only way I have of estimating its size is by the administrative pasture corral that was between me and it. Even though I never saw it face to face, the split-second glimpse I got turned me into no better than a frightened three-year-old who'd just seen a monster. A conservative estimate of its size would be seven feet plus. There's no way this was a bear or a mountain lion. I've spent hundreds of nights in the mountains, and I know what I saw and heard, and I've been looking for it ever since, ever since I realized it was out there. I think it was there all the time, but I never put it all together until last year, 1991, when I met a man who told me about a sighting of a Sasquatch a few miles away from a favorite quail hunting spot of mine down in the Transverse Ranges. What got me to go investigate was that something had made me feel uneasy enough to pack up and leave early from a great hunting trip. At the time... I had no idea, but when I went out to the area of the man's sighting and heard banging and whistling in the chaparral, that's when I realized I'd heard that unique high-pitched whistle before when I was in Kern County. Since then, I read all I could on the subject, and this year I started to blow a slide whistle in an attempt to attract the creature so I could get a moving picture of it. I know this is a lot harder to do than it sounds, and I know it would take cunning and nerve to get close enough to actually film it. Well, getting back to what I remember about that night, the prominent thing would be the smell. Initially, I noticed nothing, but over the next few hours, I kept smelling what I thought were rotting oranges. At times, it smelled very strong, like when you have a bag of fruit in your refrigerator and open it, and find them green and moldy? I'm sure it was around for a few hours. I don't know how to describe it, but you could feel it. I kept hearing things, first on one side, then on the other, down below me in the creeks. 
I just sat there with my single mantle Coleman lantern on, listening. I kept trying to rationalize it away, but the experience was shocking, very hard to deal with in your mind. I decided to build a fire, and then I felt safe. At about 1 a.m., I found myself drifting off to sleep. My lantern was almost out of fuel, so I filled it and put it by my ground cloth and slept until first light. I remember thinking the birds were a good sign that had moved on. When I woke, the lantern was still burning, which helped me realize it wasn't just a bad dream. All I could think about was getting as far away from there as I could as fast as possible. But I spent a half an hour looking for tracks. But all I could find were some splashed areas near the creek and some small plants that had been pulled up and put down on a stump that weren't there the day before. All I can say about a description is that it weighs a lot more than I do and it appeared black, although I never put my light directly on it. It was gone from view in under ten seconds. In retrospect, I realize I should have stayed around the next day and looked for physical evidence, but the only thing I could think of was getting out of there. That evening, the people, they were on horseback, by the way, who had gone by just prior to the scream the night before, came by going the other way. I asked them if they would heard the thing and what they thought it was. These people worked cows in the area for years. After a short discussion about the sound I would heard and the speculation on whether it could have been a fisher, a weasel-like animal with dark fur, the older man in the group suggested that it must have been a Bigfoot. I let him bring up the subject. When I got back to town, I went to the Forest Service station office, and a man with a backpack was filing a report of how half of his food vanished from a tree in the middle of the night. He said his food was seven feet off the ground or higher, he was about six feet tall. He tied two bags of food to one side of a bear rope with a parachute cord and counterbalanced the other side with a piece of wood of equal weight. He put a 30-gallon plastic trash bag over the food about 1 a.m. that night, the night after my adventure, because it had started to rain. When he got up, the plastic bag had been stretched apart, and one bag of food was gone. Nothing was ripped, chewed, shredded, or torn. The other half was still in the tree. I've yet to meet a bear that exhibited such traits. I mentioned the word Sasquatch, and all four Forest Service employees that were in the room went silent and looked around at each other. One man said, oh, I must have been a marmot, a burrowing rodent. Since this time, I talked to a man who has lived in the area for almost... Sixty years. He told me that he and his eighty-year-old mother had seen a nine-foot-tall red Bigfoot in the area two years earlier. He described the tracks perfectly. He said he never talked about it with anybody because no one would believe him. In the same area, in 1986, two scientists doing wildlife studies reported hearing loud screams that they couldn't identify. This is the end of story number two, A Night in the Sierras. Story number three, Butte County, Oroville, California, 1969. Outtake from Weird California by Mike Moran, Joe Ostrow, Mike Mercenelli, and Mark Sergan under the chapter, Bizarre Beasts. The Big Hairy Man of Cherokee Road. Charles Jackson and his son, Kevin, got the shock of their lives on the afternoon of July 12, 1969. They were at their home on Cherokee Road in Oroville, well south or east of Bluff Creek, but not very far from the Plumas National Forest. Father and son were working peacefully in their backyard, burning rabbit entrails, when a huge ape-like creature loped out of the woods and stopped to stare at them. The beast was seven to eight feet tall, had large breasts, 
and was covered with three-inch-long gray hair except on its hands and face. The Jacksons, only fifteen feet away at the time, said that after it spotted them, it walked up to the outhouse, looked around, and suddenly ran back into the woods. Another Cherokee Road resident had a run-in with the ape-man around the same time as the Jacksons' incident. For weeks, Homer Stickley's farm had been haunted by something that screamed in the woods at night and stole apples from his trees. Then, one moonlit night, Stickley saw the culprit, a tall, hirsute, two-legged creature that walked through a nearby meadow, pausing to stand by a stump. By September, at least a dozen people had reported giant ape-like things running around Oroville, but the Cherokee Road sightings remained the most documented and credible of the lot. Six years later, people were still seeing the beasts and finding their huge footprints in the area, but the creatures remained at large. By then, Oroville had established itself as another home of North America's most famous land monster, Bigfoot. That's the end of story number three. Story number four. Wood County, Wisconsin, 1985. My sister Natalie and I decided to take the four-wheeler out after dark against my father's words. We followed the trail from our property into the McMillan Marsh. There, we were able to run along a dike system between water reservoirs. It was midwinter, and my sister, Nats, was driving the four-wheeler, and I was riding shotgun behind her along the dike. It was lightly snowing. Dark grew in fast, and we were suddenly surrounded by darkness and snow, with two headlights to show the way. Suddenly... A large seven- to eight-foot creature walked up onto the dike in front of us about fifty yards away. It stopped, turned, and looked right at us. We both noticed how the wind blew the long, light brown hair about a foot long on its side apart, and it was white underneath as the hair parted from the wind. Our four-wheeler lights were not high enough to see the face, but it had a large muscular chest and arms and walked like a man. The chest was a little more hairless so that you could see rippling muscles underneath the dark hair. It had very long arms and, well, it did not walk like a human. It sauntered along totally unafraid of us. It swaggered with long arms swinging at its side and then it went off the dike and into the wilderness. We were shocked and horrified. We sat in shock and then throttled over where its location was. There were very large footprints in the soft snow. We hurried home and never told a soul until years later. We compared what we saw, and our stories were exact. We will never forget that night. It was not a wolf a bear, or anything human. I stand by that with my soul. If it were just me, I would have blown it off as a figment, but Natalie has every detail to the exact of my own. Miriam, Wednesday, February 29th, 2012. That's the end of story number four. Story Number 5. A Strange Story from Clark County, Washington, August 2006. My brother-in-law and I were headed east on Lucia Falls Road, northeast, when we saw something on our left, sort of like it might have been a shooting star. It was still light outside, but barely. We thought it might have been a light airplane crashing. He was a medic. So we pulled over to the side of the road and got out of the truck and listened, but heard nothing. No cries for help. No sounds of metal burning. Silence. This area is due south of the city of Yakult and east of Louisville, Washington. But only a stone's throw away from Molten Falls State Park proper. We had been 
over on Yakult Mountain Road earlier and had come down this way via Northeast Kelly Road where the intersects with Lucia Falls Road. Thinking we should help if it was a plane down, we worked our way through the brush and trees to where the railroad tracks parallel Lucia Falls Road, and I told him that one of us better run back and get a flashlight in case it was a down plane and somebody was hurt. He yelled he was going on ahead to see if he could find the source of the flash of light and look for survivors. At this point, I stopped and turned around real quick to race back to the truck. I have a high-powered spotlight that was portable. In the back of my mind, I was hoping that the batteries were still good. When I turned to make my way back to the truck, I could swear I saw a big man higher up on the road near the truck, just standing there. But I caught my foot, looking down for a minute to get a better grasp on where I was stepping, and when I looked up again, he wasn't there. I called out to him, but got no reply. Limping a little, I finally got back to the truck. The batteries were working fine, and it was almost completely dark by this time. I grabbed my wife's cell phone off the seat, tucked it into my pocket, shouldered a loop of a rope just in case, it, and grabbed the lantern. I don't remember seeing another car on the road anywhere, but I remembered wondering where this man had come from that I had seen on my way up from below the apron of the road on my way up to the truck. He was nowhere in sight. I turned and hurried on to catch my brother-in-law and wondered, too, where he was because, by now, I was barely finding my way, and it was getting darker. I called out to him, but no answer. I moved on slowly toward where I thought I had left him at the railroad tracks and looked both ways on the track, but didn't see anything or my brother-in-law. I called out again and listened intently. There was no sound of anything, no wind, not even crickets. So I cupped my hands around my mouth and called out my brother-in-law's name in both directions of the railroad tracks, but I heard nothing, saw nothing, and began to wonder if that man figure upon the road was him a few minutes ago, but I couldn't figure out how he would have gotten there from where I left him. I picked up a rock and placed it in a strategic spot on the rail of the tracks to mark where I should head for the road and began walking east on the railroad tracks, aiming my lantern to the left and right of me, looking for him. Now I'm thinking something happened to him because he wasn't answering. Darkness fell quickly as I pressed on, uncertain I was going in the right direction of the flash that we thought we saw. I don't know how far I walked on those tracks, but my ankle was beginning to hurt, so I stopped to loosen the strings on my shoe and call out for John again. Still, no answer. And now I'm growing concerned. Should I go back and wait at the truck or press on? I listened but heard nothing but the sound of my own breathing. I checked my watch, and it was already after eight in the evening, I called out for John again, then turned to head back to the truck to phone home when I remembered I had my wife's cell phone in my pocket. The lantern scanned the tracks and train left and right of the tracks as I came back upon the marker rock I had placed on the rails. No sign of John, but maybe he went the other direction. I thought so. I left the marker rock on the road and walked the tracks in the other direction for about fifteen minutes, calling out for him all the while. About the only thing I noticed was the quiet. Where was my damn brother-in-law? It's roughly nine o'clock at night now and no sign of John, but I didn't want to leave him behind. I sat down and pulled out the cell phone and dialed home. I tried to explain where I was and what had happened, but I couldn't explain where John had wandered off to, and I told the gals that I wasn't leaving here without him. Just as I was about to hang up, I heard footsteps coming and the disturbance of gravel on the railroad ties. I flashed the lantern around and down the tracks where I heard the footsteps and thought I saw John coming. John! I yelled out several times. Then I told the girls he was coming and hung up the phone. 
John looked a mess. Hey, where have you been, buddy? I asked. He reached out and put his big arms around my neck and said he was glad to see me. Well, I didn't know you went in this direction. Bud, where you been? What happened to you? He just hung on to me and said, Can we get me back to the truck right now? I asked, Are you hurt? No, John replied, just scared shitless. What happened? You've been gone over an hour. We started walking back towards where I had the marker rock on the rails. John sort of leaning on me. Oh, man, you're not going to believe this. Believe what, I asked. What the hell's been going on with you, bud? Uh, I saw something, he said. Something huge. Yeah? What, is there a plane crash? I asked. I gotta sit down, he groaned. My heart's coming out of my chest, and man, I didn't see any plane. We walked with arms around each other's shoulders till we got back to my marker on the, on the rail and sat down in the gravel and turned off the lantern. John sat there in the dark for a few minutes with his head down between his knees, trying to collect himself. He was visibly shaken. He told me there was something out there. He said, Something man-shaped, very tall, but looked like the thing had hair on it. Then I lost enough light to tell much other than it stood off to the side of the tracks in a hulking manner, me facing it and it facing me for a long time. I heard it breathing. I swear, I heard the thing breathing, and I froze. Man, I just froze stiff. My mind shut down, and I couldn't think what to do. I, I thought I was seeing things, he continued. It was something nightmares are made out of, and I don't recall I ever saw anything or a man that big before, and I never want to see anything like that again. I started to back up and run, but I couldn't see well. Kept tripping on the rails, cross ties and such, and falling down. I, I think I'm all skinned up. Well, let's get home. Back home, he recounted the same story to the girls. He was all cut up on the knees, skinned up like, and bleeding with one bad place on the side of his right rib where he said he fell on something, maybe a railroad railing or one of the ties. My brother-in-law is a big man, tall, and he describes this thing he saw as huge and hairy. Then I started wondering about the dark figure I saw up on the road that I called out to when I went back for the flashlights. My son and I went back to the area the next morning and walked two miles in either direction, but found nothing. No sign of any plane down, no fire, no nothing. From John's description, we thought maybe he had a meeting with a Sasquatch, but we weren't sure. We never did know what the flash of light was. Whatever it was scared him, and he's a seasoned hunter, son of a slew of seasoned hunters, and he don't drink. So I don't know what he saw. I didn't see or hear anything other than the figure on the road, but I believe my brother-in-law did, and he believes... It must have been a Sasquatch. My name is Marshall. I've lived in this area all my life, and so was my wife. This was a first. August 2006. That ends the reading of the five stories. Thank you for listening. Welcome. This story is being brought to you by William Jevning, and is being narrated by me, Jim Sower. The title of this story, Clue to Gorilla Men Found May Be Lost Race of Giants, July 16, 1924. The Siatic, Siatko, and other spelling variations. Clallam Indians tell of eight-foot Siatics who killed game by hypnotism, existence kept secret by other tribes. Hoke William Washington, Mountain devils discovered at Mount St. Helens near Kelso are none other than the Siotic tribe, said George Totsky, Clallam tribe editor of The Real American, an Indian National Weekly publication in an interview here today. Siotic is a Clallam pronunciation. All other tribes pronounce it Siatko. 
the Indians of the Northwest have kept the existence of the Siatics a secret, partly because they know no white man would believe them, and the Indian, known for his honesty and truthfulness, does not like to be called a liar, and partly because the Northwestern Indian is ashamed of the Siatic tribe, said Totsky. The mountain devils or gorillas who bombarded the prospector's shack on Mount St. Helens in 1924, according to the description of the miners, are none other than the Siatic tribe, with whom every Indian in the Northwest is familiar, said Totsky. Were thought to be extinct. The Siatics were last heard of by the Clallam Indians about 15 years ago, approximately 1899 to 1909. And it was believed by the present-day Indians that they had become extinct. The Siatic tribe also made their home in caves, in the heart of the wilderness on Vancouver Island, and in the Olympic Range, in particular Mount St. Helens. As described by the Clallam Indians, the Siatics are seven to eight feet tall. They have hairy bodies like the bear. They are great hypnotists and kill their game by stunning them with hypnotic power. They also have a gift of ventriloquism, throwing their voices at great distances and can imitate any bird in the Northwest. They have a very keen sense of humor, Totsky added. In the past generations, they stole many Indian women and Indian babies. They lived entirely in the mountain, coming down to the shores only when they wanted a change of diet. The Quinaults claimed that they generally came once a year to the Quinault River, about fall. The Clallams say they favored the river area near Brennan on Hood Canal. After having their fill of fresh salmon, they stole dried salmon from the Indian women. The Siatic tribe are harmless if left alone. The Clallam tribe, however, at one time several generations ago, killed a young man of the Siatic tribe to their everlasting sorrow, for they killed off a whole branch of the Clallam tribe but one and he was merely left to tell the tale to the other Clallams up sound. The Clallam Indians believed that the Siatic tribe had become extinct. It is fifteen years since their tracks were last seen and recognized at the Brennan River. Prior to that time, many Clallam Indians have met and talked with men of this strange tribe, for the Siatics talk the strange tongue of the Clallams, which is said to have originated from the bear tongue. The Quinault Indians, however, claim that Fred Pope of the Quinault tribe and George Hyasman of the Satsup tribe were fishing about fifteen miles up the Quinault River in the month of September four years ago, 1920, when they were visited by the Siatics. The two Indians had caught a lot of steelhead trout, which they had left in their canoe, and the Siatics stole these. Henry Napoleon of the Clallam tribe is the only Indian who has ever been invited to the home of the Siatic tribe. It was while Napoleon was visiting relatives on the British Columbia coast about thirty years ago, that would have made the year roughly 1895, that he met a Siatic while hunting. The giant Indian then invited him to their home, which is in the very heart of the wilderness of Vancouver Island. Napoleon claims that they live in a large cave. He was treated with every courtesy and told some of their secrets. He claims that the giant Indians made themselves invisible by strange medicine that they rub over their bodies, and that they were able to cause great fear by hypnotic power, and had the gift of ventriloquism, to mimic the owl and throw their voices. Some Indians claim that during the process of evolution, when the Indian was changing from animal to man, the Siatic did not fully absorb the Tamanois, or soul power, and thus he became an anomaly in the process of evolution. The Indians of the Northwest are of the belief that the mountain devils found at Mount St. Helens are indeed the Siatic Indians, and it is generally their custom to frighten persons who have displeased them by throwing rocks at them. This is the end of the story. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to this episode. 
of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.